Thank you for joining today. I believe this study today will change how you read the Bible. Two things are going to happen today. There will be those that will catch the revelation of what I'm about to share with you and that there are others that will see the art of biblical exposition. And I think a lot of times we don't understand the purpose of homiletics is to create an art of oratory, an art of expression. Why the revelation hits your heart, the style touches, it presents an art. And there was something about the art of communication. So if you are there for the art of homiletics, then this will bless you. But if you are there also for the revelatory teaching that will pierce your heart, this will also bless you. I believe that the book of Acts is actually, and uh, uh, um, I believe it's a, it's a historical account of the church for about 30 plus years. Uh, but I believe that looking beyond just the letters of Luke uh, will give, I mean, will launch us into... Uh, it will change the game. I think that's the word. And as a church, I thought about it. Uh, we've organized flames and I thought about my house. I thought about our local church. I thought about how can we make impact. We cannot be a global name without first having private revivals. So if you are not part of the Brook Place and you don't have a church and you're looking for a church to join, come on, up around, come in on Sundays, 4 p.m. or 4.30 p.m. at the moment, actually. So please come around, come see if you like a church. We are a Bible-believing prophetic apostolic hub and an evening church. So if you want that extra church, please do join us. Uh, we're also online as well for those of you that are RTBPG. TBP Global, uh, we care about you, we love you, too, we love you too, and we believe that this will bless you. For the next two months, I believe, month of October and November, I have practically taken over the Facebook page and the YouTube as we will be engulfing and, 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 and engaging in this wonderful conversation. But thank you. I see all your comments. Wherever you are joining from, I see all your comments. The good thing about this study is that most likely, at the end of every study, you might have like a quiz just to test how much you've grasped what we've been talking about. So you might have a quiz. And for our church, uh, we're not be having what you call cell groups. And the purpose of the cell group is to have a discussion and, and learn again. And it's sort of, you know, uh, you're going to see cell groups, cell groups in this study today. But yes, so I don't want to bore you with my many, many commentaries. But today, I believe that this will change again. So Welcome. If you are not aware, I like to use the NKJV and I might share my screen with you like this, I believe. Use the NKJV and the NKJV will change the game for you. I think I've got something to share with you. I might, might be this, I think. So we have like, is the NKJV? You can see that on your screen. Is the NK So just in case I'm not sharing my screen with you, I'm looking at my iPad here because sometimes I might forget to share my screen, but I will be ready. So you need to have your own personal Bible so that it will change the game for you. All right, so I'm super duper excited to be with you today. And I believe that we have already begun and this will change the game for us. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Lord, we thank you for your word you're about to hear. The entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple. We pray as we engage the text of scriptures that our minds are open to the revelation of the text, that you will bless the hearers of your word. Lord, we don't want to be hearers only. We want to be doers of your word. As we receive the revelation, let there be impartation, illumination, transformation, revolution, revelation, everything that we need in the season that will make us better believers in our faith, in our work, and as we represent you as ambassador on the face of the earth. If you believe that word, you need to type an amen along. Amen. But thank you for joining everybody. God bless you. Thank you. I am excited. We have we have 43 of you on Facebook and the YouTube as well. Let me give an account before um, we go. YouTube as well. Uh, 47. My God. So we have almost uh, 100 people joining us today. But thank you all the way from around the nations of the world. All right. The book of Acts. It's a uh, an unfortunate trans, an unfortunate name given to the book is Acts of the Apostles. But if you look at the book of Acts, really, you realize that, let me make this silent, you realize that the book of Acts actually um, only has three apostles mentioned, and which are Peter, Philip, and Paul. And so it's, it is an unfortunate title, the book of Acts of the Apostles. To be honest, the book of Acts is not really about the Holy Spirit. And that's what a lot of people do not know. The book of Acts is a continuation of Christ's work through his spirit. So the emphasis on Acts is the, the, the man by the name of Luke who is presenting a case that even though Jesus died, is resurrected and is still working on the face of the earth through the agency of his spirits in the life of believers. And I, and I said to a couple of friends of mine a couple of years ago that the reason why we have the Holy Spirit right now is because when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, he could not replicate himself, himself on everybody. So there was no omnipresence. He was only at a place at a time. 
in a place at a time. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that I, I need to go so that the comfort that will come, the paraclesis, and the purpose of the paraclesis is that it comes and comforts the believer. So Christ was broken so the Spirit can be given to everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. Everyone who believes in God have the Holy Spirit in them. There are some words that I might be using that might challenge your theological overview, but I want you to be like the Bereans. Receive the word, pray about the word, and make sure that all I've said is written in the soil of scripture. This is the part you are the Bereans. Like Romans 11, it's something 11, that says that the believers in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the words with all humility. Search the scriptures to make sure all that Paul had said is written or was written in the scriptures. This is the part I want you to be like the Bereans. Everything I've said to you, first and foremost, before you confront the word and argue the word, first make sure you receive the word and pray about the text and make sure all I've said is in the scriptures. This might oppose your view, antagonize your view, shake you, shift you, but the purpose is to bring the word of God in its fullest clarity that the church is edified. The book of Acts, like I mentioned before, is the continuation of the work of Jesus when he walked on the face of the earth. Now it's working in the life of believers through his spirit. We know that Acts was written by the man by the name of Luke, who was uh, an associate of Paul. And it's interesting if you look at the opening remark of the book of Acts, if you have your Bibles quickly, in Acts chapter number one, where the Bible says, The former accounts are made to you, O Theophilus. In chapter number one to verse number one to verse number three of the book of Luke, realize that Luke addressed him as most excellent Theophilus, an official title. But now we find in the book of Acts chapter number one, he called him O Theophilus, an endearing title, which means that for some reason, a lot of people, theologians believe that. At one point when he wrote the book of Luke, he wasn't really saved. And now the second volume of Luke, Acts, he's been saved. And that's the reason why I use the word all Theophilus. But I believe that in, in the things of God, there are no coincidences, there are no mistakes. You know, so everything that is in the scripture is there by deliberate design. Every word, every place, every name, every letter is there by prophetic engineering. And the Lord saw the future in history. And when he did things in allegory, in analogies, in his literal view, it's because there was a picture. The man by the name of Theophilus, even though we understood him to be uh, someone who was actually um, uh, within the Roman caliphate, the Roman system, um, but Paul, uh, but Luke was making us understand that that name Theophilus can be used also of the church, Theophileo. Theo means God and Philio is friendship. So it means a friend of God. So we believe that the Bible says that Jesus says, you are no longer slaves. You are now my friends. I call you friends. If Jesus calls the disciples friends, it means that we also are disciples of Jesus. We are friends. So in our way, technically, it's also written to the church. As much as it was written to a literal man by the name of Theophilus, it is also written to the church. All right. All right. God will give you strength, believe you. God bless you. Your heart is open to receive the word of the Lord. All right. So we understand. Um, so um, the, the Luke addressed this letter to Theophilus. A lot of theologians believe that this was almost like a, a, a prosecutor. A, a, a defense statement um, written of a Paul's defense statement before Felix and Festus, but we don't want to go there. But a lot of you may not even understand. There was a man by the name of Josephus who was a first century th um, a philosopher, a historian, who made a mention of the of the man by the name of Theophilus and said that Theophilus actually um, was a very wealthy Roman, a, a wealthy guy, so so wealthy that he gave um, um, a part of his palace um, for the preaching of the gospel, and 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 the name of the palace was called the Basilica. The Basilica was the name of the palace that Theophilus had given the believers at the time to use is used for the preaching of the gospel. And it was very common back in the day that physicians were slaves. You know, we have a, a, a contemporary view of physicians as doctors to be very wealthy and independent. But back in the day, it was very common that those who practiced some sort of medicine or, or, or physicians or doctors, they were, um, they were sort of slaves. They had owners. And it is a lot of theological view that Luke, who was a physician, could probably or possibly had been a slave to Theophilus and, of course, shared the gospel with Theophilus. And we saw that he gave um, Theophilus and, and Luke the place to use. But in, in chapter number one of the book of um, Acts, we, we saw also a marching order given. Jesus says to the disciples to wait in, in Jerusalem until they were empowered of the Holy Spirit that they would be, mentioned the word, they would be possessive, they would be witnesses first in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the outermost part of the earth. And that is how the book of Acts was is categorized. Uh, we see um, B, 
be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. That is Peter's designation. Um, so Peter will spend time in Jerusalem and in Judea. You find that in Acts chapter number 1 to chapter number 7. In Samaria, you find that from chapter number 8 to chapter number 12, which is Philip's, and the outermost part of the Gentile world, chapter number 13 to the end of chapter, to the end of Acts 28. Does that make sense? So this is how you find the uh, you find the classification. You shall be witnesses. And as Bible study students, we have a way to look at how scriptures are broken down from just the words of men, the Amar, the Dabar, or the Logos. Uh, we understand, you know, it says in verse number six, you shall be witnesses. Jesus says of me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And it's interesting that there were three apostles who took these spaces, Jerusalem, Judea, but it's interesting, there's a distinction between Philip the Apostle and Philip the Deacon. All right, very important. Philip the Apostle and Philip the Deacon. Um, so we find chapter number one to chapter number seven as Peter's this jurisdiction, which is Jerusalem and Judea. So chapter number one of Acts to chapter number seven, you find Peter's work in Jerusalem. Now, that, that does not mean that it wasn't Peter who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. It wasn't Paul. It was Peter who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. And there will be a Petrine definitive statement in look in Acts chapter number 10. You find Cornelius. It was Peter who brought the gospel, not Paul, just to let you know. However, if you look at the classification, chapter number 1 to 7 deals with Jerusalem and Judea. Chapter number 8 to chapter number 12 deals with Samaria. Samaria is the middle place between Jerusalem and Galilee. Right, Judea and Galilee. Galilee the north, Judea the south, and then Samaria the middle. That was by Philip. And chapter number 13 to 28 was the life, the work, the ministry, and the accomplishments of Paul. Then the Bible says also at, at the end, they made um, up the mid lots and the apostleship fell on a man by the name of Matthias, which almost sounds like God's chosen one. And so we ended on Sunday that Matthias was chosen by Lot. And one of the ways that Lot was done back in the day, the Bible says the disciples prayed, the apostles prayed, and they, they cast in their lots, and it fell on Matthias, and he was counted amongst the eleven. Because Peter was the one making the whole arrangement. So we ended in chapter number um, in chapter number one. Um, so we want to dive into chapter number two of the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to follow me if you have your Bibles, okay? If you have your Bibles, we are ready to roll i believe we are ready to roll scriptures let us go the bible says when the day uh, so i'm going to share my scripture with you and sometimes i might look at my ipad on this side just so that i am with catching stuff with you all right bible says when the day now in it in, in in chapter number two verse number one it, it speaks about the promise of the holy ghost remember jesus said to them to wait in jerusalem and we read in the last verses of chapter number one that they've left the Olivet, Mount Olivet, and they've gone to Jerusalem. They've gone to the upper room. And I made mention of the mystery of the upper room or the mystics that people have about the upper room. The upper room was not a place of power. The reason why it's called upper room was because it had enough space to accommodate a lot of people. They were about 120 people and they could not fit in the dance space, so they went to the upper room. So the purpose of upper, upper room doesn't mean the anointed place. It just means a place for communal gathering. It had space for more than 100 people and above. The Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Now, there is no way I'm going to do this teaching without take you through a bit of uh, uh, Leviticus chapter number 23, if you have your time. It speaks about the feast of the Lord. Uh, and the Bible says the Lord gave seven feasts. And I want to grab your, atten your, your attention today because I'm going to design this feast or draw this feast or you're going to see my notes in a moment. And the purpose of this feast is to, is to explain to you the purpose of the word Pentecost, okay, or Shavuot, okay? So what I want to do right now is to take you back to my notes. Hopefully you will see my note here. We are there. All right, I believe you are there. You can see my note now. You can see these notes very well. Okay. All right, there were seven feasts of Israel. I'm going to write the seven feasts in their numbers now, all right? So the number one is called the Passover. Follow me, guys. Follow me slowly. That's number one. Number two is called unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. If you can take a screenshot, you can write right. Number three is called the first fruits. All right? first fruits number four is called the feast of weeks or shavuot feast of weeks 
Number five is called Feast of Trumpets. Number six is called Yom Kippur. And number seven is called Tabernacles. All right, so I might do this with you today. I might join space with you today so you can see this properly. Let me see if I do something here. One second, guys. Okay. Yep, there you go. All right, so I can see your face as well. Now, these are seven feasts, but it's called the Feast of the Lord in Leviticus chapter number 23. Now, if you look at the scripture, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Look at the scripture again. The Bible says, when the day, it's a day. And the reason why we want to deal with the day of Pentecost is because there was a difference between this feast and a denomination. Pentecostal is a denomination and it is different from Pentecost. The word Pentecoste is a Greek word for 50. Remember that the New Testament is translated in Greek and the Old Testament is translated in Hebrew, right? So the Hebrew word for Pentecost is the word Shavuot. S-H-A-V-O-U-T, V-U-O-T, Shavuot. The word Shavuot means feast of weeks, all right? But because we are reading the Greek New Testament, we call it Pentecost, from the word Pentecosti. Now, I want to bring it back again because we are studying. I see we are studying. Let's go back again to the notes, all right? In the notes, you realize that we have the first feast called Passover. The second feast called a living bread. The third feast called feast of first fruits. The fourth feast called Feast of Shabbat or Pentecost or Feast of Weeks. The fifth feast called the Feast of Trumpets. The sixth feast that is called the Feast of Yom Kippur. And the seventh feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you look at these seven feasts, the first three feasts, feasts have been fulfilled already. The Feast of Passover, this first one here, represents the death of Jesus. It is the Passover lamb. It was Jesus who was the, picture, the prophetic picture of the lamb that was slain. So Passover represents the, uh, the, the uh, represents the, uh, the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. All right, that is in our past. The next piece is called unleavened bread, which speaks of the body. If you understand, the unleavened bread is a bread that is used. Uh, and this bread actually is, it has some, some marks on it. It's a bit dark. And it looks like something beaten. It speaks of the body that was buried. All right. So on leaven bread speaks of the burial. All right. The burial of Jesus. Very important. First fruit. Bible said Jesus became the first fruit of those who slept. In the New Testament, when a believer dies, they don't die, they sleep. Everywhere you find death in the New Testament for a believer, the word death, the slept is used as a euphemism. It's used, okay? So, first fruit speaks of the resurrection. So, you have this number one, number two, I'm going to mark it. Number one to number three. All this one, all these ones here, I'm going to call these ones number three. Okay. Number one to number three have been accomplished already and it's always in the spring passover or leaven bread first fruit is always done the feast is always in the spring very important always in the spring the next four feasts have been trusting feast now the next feast is called the feast of shavuot or the feast of trumpet this is the one here right it's called the feast of weeks or the shavuot now this is another name for the shavuot all right we have a lot of work to do today, okay? Shavuot, S-H-A-V-U-O-T, Shavuot, or it's called Feast of Weeks. It's an interesting feast, but I'm going to go back to the previous feast, and the, the reason why I'm going to go back to the previous feast, pre feast is because I want to show you how this will work. Now, let's keep the Feast of Shavuot for now. The last three feasts, are in the future a lot of depending on your eschatological view a lot of people believe that the feast of trumpets represents the rapture of the church the feast of yom kippur represents the parousia the second coming of jesus and the feast of tabernacles represents the millennial kingdom so for a lot of people they see passover as the death of christ a living bread as his burial first fruits as the resurrection then I'll come there to the, to the, to the third one because that's, that's, a, that's a fourth one that is between the first three and the last three. The last three is always in the autumn or we call it autumn here, you know, fall in America. Or Yeah, so we have the first three as the uh, spring feast. 
that has been done already. And it happened on the very day that it was fulfilled. Now, the next three phases, the last three phases are the phase of trumpets, which a lot of people believe that is the rapture of the church. Uh, the next one, the feast of Yom Kippur, which they believe is a, a prophetic picture of the Perusia, the second coming. And then the last one, the feast of um, the feast of Tabernacles, which we call Purim. Now, the first three are done in the spring. The last three are done in the fall. The first three has been fulfilled. The last three is yet to be fulfilled. But there was one in the middle. And that there was something about Jesus being at the center. That one in the middle is done in the summer. Spring, summer, and fall, or spring, summer, and autumn. That one that is done in the summer is called Pentecost. And Pentecost is the giving of the Spirit. It was the day that the law was given to the Jews. That was the same day that the Spirit was given to the church. So when the Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, it is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. So the can't. 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, which is the feast of some 40, which is um, 49 days plus one, it's called the counting of the Omer. Another name for Pentecost is called the counting of the Omer. Let me write it now. The counting of the Omer. You might see that in some books. Counting of the Omer. It's also called Pentecost. But the good thing about Pentecost, now hear me, it will blow your mind. Pentecost is the middle ground between the first three feasts and the last three feasts. <coughs> Pentecost is the middle ground between that feast, those feasts that have been fulfilled in Jesus' first coming and the one that will be fulfilled in his second coming. Now, the reason why this is important is because this was the feast. This was the feast that we read about in Acts chapter number 2. But if you look at the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse 16, there were three compulsory feasts that every Jewish man from the age of 20 must attend. And these three feasts is from one of these three seasons. One of them in the spring, one of them in the summer, or the other one in the summer, and one of them in the autumn and fall. The one in the spring is called Passover. The one in the summer is called Pentecost. And the one in the fall or the, or the autumn is called Tabernacles or Purim. All right. So we have these three feasts are compulsory. They are compulsory for every Jewish believer. One in the spring and is called the Feast of Passover. One in the summer is called the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot. And one in the uh, uh, in the in autumn or the fall is called the Feast of Tabernacles. So you realize that in these feasts or these three seasons, Jerusalem is packed with a lot of people. For other feasts, we can decide not to go. It's not compulsory. But these are three compulsory feasts. And that is the reason why, if you read much later, you realize that they would have won over 3,000 or 3,000 souls because Jerusalem was packed with a lot of people. Are you following me? Just to give you an overview of the reason why this is important and interesting. So the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that day is the 50th day after the resurrection. So Pentecost is 50 days after the giving of the Omar, or 50 days after the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is 7 times 7, 49 plus the last day, 50. So the, the next day after the Feast of Weeks. So when you look at Pentecost, it is the 50th day of resurrection or the next day after resurrection does that make sense so it's the 50th day the bible says that when the day so it is that day the church did not birth pentecost the church happened to be born on that jewish feast or that feast of the lord and i think the reason why because there is a very theological and biblical view of the word pentecostal pentecostal is not the birth of shabbat However, the Spirit of the Lord was given on the day of Pentecost. So the Jewish people understood that that was Pentecost before the church was born. So whilst the disciples are not called the church at the moment, they understood that that was a day that was celebrated among the Jewish believers, the Jewish brethren. Does that make sense? So now that we understand that, that Pentecostalism is different from Shavuot. However, we understand the purpose of Pentecostalism because we believe in the giving of the Spirit. So the reason why we, ha we have the denomination as Pentecostal was because that was the day that the Spirit was given to the church. However, the church did not birth the Spirit, the Spirit birthed the church. We must understand this to understand the whole idea of the baptism of the Spirit. The church did not birth Pentecost. The church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. It was the Spirit of the Lord that birthed the church. 
So if you go back to the text of scripture, you realize that what I'm saying might make sense in a minute. Okay, let's go back. The Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully, that word fully meant that, you know, it has been, you know, the Passover for, it's like we've done Passover, resurrection, uh, Passover, or living bread, resurrection. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that 50th day, they were all with one accord. Now, I'm going to rush this because of time. I don't want to spend all the time in the world. But are you being blessed, church? The Bible says they were all with one accord. They were all with one accord in one place. So they realized that the church spread. And the context of one place is the same context you will find as the Shekinah. The Bible says that all the disciples were gathered together in one place. If you look at the previous scripture, chapter number 1, and in the last verses, we realize that there were 120 people in one place. 120 people in one place. I see your comments, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says that, and suddenly, now hear me, the reason why the word suddenly was used it was because they did not expect. They've celebrated Pentecost before today. They, this Pentecost was not their first Pentecost. It is the first one for the church, but not the first one for the Jews. But it is the first one for the Jewish believers because it's the first time experienced the Pentecost as brethren of the church. For the Jewish believers, Shavuot is not new. They've already celebrated Shavuot. So they were not expecting something. They were not expecting anything. So it was sudden because they had no expectation. However, you can reflect, you can take your mind in respect, in res, uh, introspectively or retrospectively back. Jesus says that it will not be far from when he would ascend to heaven that the spirit will be given. So this something, they were expecting something, they were not expecting a sound. They know that Jesus said to them to wait until they were endued with power. But they had no clue what they were waiting for. Does, does that make sense? They had no clue that they were waiting for this thing because they were not expecting a sound. There was ne there's never been a sound on the day of Pentecost. There's never been a, been a wind on the day of Pentecost. A day of Pentecost was just a day that they would go to, go to the temple. Make this very clear. All the feasts that you mentioned, all of the eight feasts that is mentioned, seven of the feasts, yeah, it will blow your mind, seven of them are leaven bread is used. The only feast that you use leaven is the feast of Shavuot. Yeah, me again. Leaven is a type of sin. And leaven is known to be sinful because it pops up as you as it, as, as it, blows, it grows, it pops up. So leaven is known to be a type of sin. Allegorically, type of sin. It's interesting that this is the only face that leaven was used, which tells you that the church is not perfect. Uh, I wish I was preaching at the, at the broke place. I, I think I am, practically. So the face of Shabbat is the only face that two loaves have waved. And these two loaves that we see is leaven. And the two loaves represent the Jews and the Gentiles. They've been baptized into one body. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not tongues. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is an initiation into the family of Christ. You only baptize once, but you are in fear or in word every time. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an association, identification with a regenerative, you know, transformative process. So the only feast that leaven is used is the feast of Shabbat, the feast of Pentecost, which tells me that the church is not perfect. The only perfect one is Jesus. Are you here in church? And this is the only thing that brought two kinds of people together. The Jews and the Gentiles are baptized. Baptized, not speaking in tongues. Baptized means they have been identified into this, this union, into this body of Christ. Very important. Because the Bible says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. It has never happened before. They were not expecting a sound at all, but it was a sudden manifestation. Does that make sense? They've always celebrated Shabbat. They've never celebrated Shabbat with an experience. For them, Shabbat was the time going to the temple because it was compulsory in Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse 16, that every Jewish man from 20 years old must be at the temple, must be in Jerusalem. So one in the spring, which is the Passover, one in the summer, which is Shabbat, and one in the fall or the autumn, which is actually tabernacles. So they were not expecting a sound. But the Bible says that a sound came from heaven. As of now, the sound was not a wind. Okay, I'm getting hot here. The sound was not a wind. That what you call rhetorical devices. Rhetorical devices are using parts of figure of speech to to mean something. The Bible never say that a sound came from heaven, or the sound of a wind, as of a wind. 
So the wind, the sound that came was the sound of a wind. Oh. And we understand that this, the wind is representative of the Holy Spirit. The same word used as Ruach in the Old Testament. The same word used as the word as, as, as a Numa in the New Testament. It was not a physical wind. And, and, and that's the reason why it's a surprise. Because if it was a physical wind, we wouldn't be surprised because wind have sound. For instance, I'm in my house now, I'm in my office, for instance. And if I start hearing the sound of a wind, I'm not going to be surprised because wind have sounds. But the reason why people were surprised was because there was a sound, but there was no wind. Hence, it was the sound of a wind and not a wind. A lot of you have preached this sermon and preached it as wind. It is not correct. We understand that wind represents the Holy Ghost. But what brought the people here was not a physical wind. It was the sound of a wind. And the reason for their shock or why they were surprised was because they could hear the sound but could not feel it. The wind blew it where it wishes, where it listed. They could hear the sound but could not feel the wind. And that's the reason why it was supernatural. There was a sound of convocation. There was a clarion call calling the people. There was a sound that was being made. The church was birthed with the announcement by a sound. Very important. It was a sound and not a wind. So the Bible says it was as of a mighty rushing wind. I've seen people preach about the mighty rushing wind of Acts. Well, that is not true because it was not a wind. It was a sound. We emphasize so much on the wind and we forget it's the sound that brought the men together, not the wind. Now, I don't want to spend all the time here. Come to church on Sunday. We will dive in into more, some more stuff. It's a lot to unpack. The Bible said that it was a sound as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled the whole house that they were sitting. That word filled can be used as the word pleru or pimpleni also. But it was a sound that filled the whole house, not the wind. Wind cannot fill a house. That in that context, it was a sound. It was a sound that filled the entire house. We don't know what kind of a sound it was. It was an it was a heavenly sound. It's interesting, and I feel for me when people ask me what is the meaning of Pentecostal. I don't define Pentecostal from Shabbat. I define Pentecostal from sound. You know a Pentecostal church by the sound they release. Oh my God! If you're Pentecostal in the house, give the Lord a sound. <laughs> give the Lord a shout. The Bible said it was a sound. And it filled the whole house. Hear me. Hear me. It did not fill the upper room. There was no mysticism in the upper room. It filled the house. And I love the way Luke was able to put everything in perspective. Why? Because if Luke had said it filled the upper room, a lot of you would have deified the upper room. You would have made the upper room a sacred place. But the Bible said it filled the whole house. The kitchen, the bathroom, downstairs, upstairs, you know, the balcony. It filled the whole house. Are you hearing church? There is nothing magical about upper room. There is nothing superficial about upper room. There is nothing supernatural about upper room. It was a room that had enough space to accommodate people. And that's why when the Spirit of the Lord came, the sound was not just heard in the upper room. The sound filled the entire house. Are you hearing me, church? The sound filled the entire house. And I love this scripture because a lot of people have deified this upper room experience. And don't get me wrong, this is an experience because they prayed in the upper room, but it was not exclusive to that space of the house. The entire house received the same sound. You need to hear that. The entire house received the same sound. And in my belief, I think Luke was prophetic. He was looking into the future. Because it's very easy for prophetic people to say stuff like, well, the upper room is the only place for the anointing. You want to hear the voice of God, go to the upper room. That is not scripture. The sound came and filled the entire house. Some of the type filled the house. My God. And I believe that if there is anything that we need in the church, we don't need the sound of God just to fill the top tiers or fill the leaders only or fill the senior pastors only. It fills the entire house. And that's the reason why a healthy church is a church that the Spirit of the Lord fills everyone from the top to the bottom. Are you hearing church? Not just the leaders because that's called papacy. Not that's called popery. When the Pope feels like he's the only one that qualifies to be filled of the Spirit or hears from God and the congregation have been deemed or termed to be in sin and is the only one who partakes of transubstantiation but i believe that this is the purpose for congregationalism that everyone in the house experiences this encounter are you hearing it and feed the entire house everyone in the house heard and i believe that that's the reason why i believe that if you are a church yeah, me church if you're a church every encounter that the senior leader experiences everyone should have access to the encounter it filled the entire house amen it filled the entire house as a church we believe that 
The, the sound of heaven fills the hearts of our children. Not just the choir leaders, not just the pastor, not just the senior leadership team, not just the praying team. Everyone that comes into our house must share with son. And that's my prayer. That at the end of these 28 chapters, everyone that comes to the brook place, that hears the sound of our church, that they will be filled with the revelation of heaven. It filled the house, not the elites. Are you hearing? It filled the house and not the elite. It filled the house. The Bible says, and, 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 and in verse number 3, and, and then they appeared to them. Divided tongues as a fire. Again, it wasn't fire. I've seen a lot of you preach about fire. It's not fire. It's divided tongue that has the shape of fire or had the texture of fire or had the form of fire. It was not fire. It was not burning. Please hear me out. Please hear me out. Forget everything that you felt you knew for just today and hear me. It was not fire. It was as of fire. It was not wind. It was as of wind. Just like you find a sound that had a windy expression, you also have this tongue that had fiery expression. It was the tongue uh, of fire. And why was it a tongue of fire? Because they were about to use their tongue for something. Their tongues were about to be activated to speak a language. So it was the tongue of fire. It's interesting that this is the tongue of fire. It therefore means that if God wants to activate our eyes, we could also have eyes of fire. I pray you hear the word of the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation, he has the eyes of fire. Are you hearing church? The Bible says, as of. The Bible says, and they appeared to them. Cloven, appeared to them, divided or cloven tongues is divided. And the word divided means that it came on one person and split and went to it. So it divided on them. This, you, you could see the, the tongues divide. But it is not fire. It's like fire. Just like it was not dove. The spirit came as a dove. The, 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 the picture represented the analogies. The allegories of a dove. This wasn't fire. This was a form of fire. Or has the shape of fire. It was evident that it was representative of fire. Just like the wind was representative of the spirit, the fire was representative of the spirit. It was the same spirit that was doing two things. The same spirit came as a sound of a wind. The same spirit came as tongue of fire. You find the different expressions of the same spirit in practically two verses. Are you hearing me, church? Please, I beg you. So that when we teach this thing, we teach with the right theology. It wasn't fire that came on them. It was the form of fire. It had the Shekinah appearance. Or the Shekinah, like you call it. The Bible says, And sat upon each of them. Hear me? It did not sit on the apostles. It sat on the disciples and the apostles. There was no separation between the clergy and the laity. It sat upon the 120 people in the upper room. As long as you were in the house, you identified with this fire. This reminded me of the redemptive process of Exodus chapter. The Bible says in Exodus, when the Lord said to Moses to mark the house and put the blood on the doorpost. It wasn't about the people, it was about the, the doorpost. If you were an Egyptian and you were found in the house where there was blood, you'd be spared. If you were an Israelite and you were found in the house where there was no blood, you'd be killed. The, the center of focus is the blood shed in the house. Everyone under the house is spared. Are you having church? Everyone under the house is spared. So if, the, if you're under the house, despite your tribe, despite your nation, you'll be spared. Because the obedience was anyone who was under the house. Just also this same scripture. Everyone who was in this same place, this upper room, had the fire. Oh God, I pray you understand. Everyone had the encounter. Because the, the fire was not the respecter of persons. It came on everyone who was in the upper room. Ah. Uh. I like a scripture. Divided tongue looked like fire. It's like a cloven of fire. It's called divided tongue because God was about to use their tongue closer. Are you hearing? The reason why it's called divided tongue, you never find divided tongue anywhere in the scripture again. The only place you find divided tongue was because God was about to use their tongue. So the, 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 the fire means that the Holy Spirit, which is similar of fire, the Holy Spirit becomes the, 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 is the one that gives them utterance. So their tongue is about to be it's about to be activated to speak a language you haven't learned. So divided tongue means the it was the, the Holy Spirit giving them enablement or empowerment. So their tongues were about to be activated. The real the real thing, the real meaning there is that the, the, it's a symbol of a tongue, 
But a symbol was the tongue of fire. Oh, Lord, help me today. Are you hearing? It was a symbol of a tongue. If the Lord was going to activate your eyes, it would have been a symbol of an eye. If it was going to activate your hand, it would have been a symbol of a hand. It was a symbol of a tongue. It was a literal tongue, but a fiery tongue. Why? Because God is about to use your tongue to be missional, to bring men to the gospel. So what did God do? He divided their tongue and represented by fire, meaning that he is the one giving them utterance. So their tongue has been overtaken or, or superimposed by the Spirit. Are you hearing me? And I pray that we give our member. That's what Paul prayed. That I pray that you give your members to the Lord. Lord, use my eyes. Lord, use my tongue. Lord, use my hand. You Lord, use my legs. Lord, use my heart. So whatever God uses as part of your body, hear me, church, he would make it cloven or divided. <laughs> Are you hearing? It was, a, it was a symbol of a tongue. Uh, and that's you're going to see the word lali or glossa, glossolia. So, so it was a thing that, that symbol means that God is about to inspire. Oh, hear the word. Thank you, Nopsis. God is about to activate your tongue for mission. So the clubby tongue was on them because God is about to use their tongue. Does that make sense? And the Bible says, as of fire and sat upon each of them, verse number four, time. I got time. Time. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Hear me? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This filling is a filling for service. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of a lot of theologians believe that there were two types of... Now, hear me, church. Hear me. And I pray you hear me. Ah, <laughs> uh, Lord. One fire was doing two things. One fire. Just like one fire, just like the Holy Ghost came as a sound of a wind and as a tongue of fire. One fire was doing two things. The Bible says, and they were all filled. Now hear me. The Holy Spirit was doing two things at the same time. Baptizing them and filling them. The word filled there is means to be called to service. It means filled for service. Hence the difference between pleru and pimplemi. Hear me. These guys were already believers. Because they've heard from the Lord and they were in the upper room. So the purpose of the baptism is to identify them as the new collective called the church. But now as God was doing the, the work of baptism, identifying them as the new collective is also filling them for power. The purpose of that tongues was to fill them for power or fill them for, for, uh, for, for mission. What I'm trying to say, the word fill there is that they have been filled for an assignment. But baptism also means that they've been identified as a church. So as they were being baptized, identified, they were being filled. Does that, it's almost like recruitment. So God was filling them for service. Why? Because the, the filling is always for service. Baptism is always for identification. So while the Spirit of the Lord was identifying them as the new collective called the church, they were being prepared for service. Are you hearing me, church? They were being prepared for service. The Bible says in chapter in, in John that the, the, the Lord breathed upon the disciples. It's called emphusa. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. So it looked like the disciples already have received the Holy That's what the Bible says in John. That when Jesus breathed on them, he says, receive the Holy Ghost. So it looked like it, they've already received the Holy Ghost via baptism. And that they are being filled for mission or for service. So why for a few of them there, they are just receiving it for others' is feeling. So you find that the Spirit of the Lord was doing two things at the same time. Baptizing them into the body and filling them for service. So you realize that they've already received the Holy Ghost in John. He's breathed upon the emphasis and said receive. So they've already received it by a... So they've already, they've already identified as the church. Now they are being filled for service. So hear me. This field here is always used for service. And this field, we are always commanded. The Bible says, be filled of the Holy Ghost. Never in the scripture are we told to be, to be, are we commanded to be baptized. Never in the scriptures have we been commanded to be baptized. We've always been commanded only to be filled. Because in baptism, is done once and for all. Your baptism is once and for all. But your infilling is consistently every day. Every day as you walk as a believer, you are consistently filled. 
But your baptism is your identification into your faith once and for all. It speaks of your eternal security once and for all. But the Bible says, and look at verse number four, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began with began to speak, you hear me, with all the tongues. The word all the tongues is not a mystery tongues. Now this act was mysterious, but the act, the, 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 the word other tongues means another language. But it is the Spirit of God that gave them utterance. They were not speaking of what they preconceived, presumed, or pre-known. They spoke through the inspiration of the Spirit. The same fire, the same tongues of fire as not being expressed, called utterance. Utterance can also be called logos also. Are you following church? So in verse number 4, the Bible says that, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with another. This is not mystery tongues. This is a known language. The first tongues that was given in chapter number 2 of the book of Acts was a tongues for another language. It wasn't a mystery that they don't understand. It's a language that they don't understand, but people understood. So this is not the gift of tongues you find in 1 Corinthians 12. This is a gift that preaches a known language. So they were speaking a known And the purpose of this known language is for mission. To evangelize the world. Are you hearing me? It is not Rama, Mama, Mama. That's not what they are speaking. They were speaking a national ethnic language that people understood, but they were not speaking of their own accord. They were speaking because the Holy Ghost was the one who gave them utterance. The one who gives the Spirit gives utterance also. And I think one of the dangers of the church, we are asking people to have an utterance, but we haven't given the Lord a heart to, to control us. If He gives you the Spirit, He gives you utterance. There is no utterance without the giving of the Spirit. Does that make sense? That's what the Bible says. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. The Bible says, and gave them utterance. So they were giving utterance. The word utterance means that they were only the instrument of inspiration. They were not the original or, or, or original uh, uh, or, the, or the originators of the language. They had no clue. They were Galileans. But they were speaking as the Lord gave them utterance. It meant that the Lord superimposed them. That's what I meant by the tongue of fire. He took over their tongue and gave them utterance. So these guys had no clue what they are saying because the Holy Ghost superimposed them and controlled their laleo, their tongue, their language. So they began to speak, not because they had learned it, because the Holy Ghost was the one that was flicking and twitching their tongues. But it was making them speak in the language of other people for mission. So you realize that these tongues is a tongues for mission. Glossolia is a tongues for salvation. It's not a prayer, it's an invitation. Because this, what they are saying, was a language that is known by other people. Because they're going to speak this in a language. The Bible says, because of time. The Bible says, and when, and, and, and there were, now we understood from verse number 1 to verse number 4, that the Spirit of the Lord has taken over their tongues. This is, a, this is, a, this is God controlling their use of words. They had all they were were conduits of inspiration or instrument of inspiration, and the spirit of the Lord was the one who was twitching their tongues. So they had no clue what they were saying. They were saying something, but could not control what they are saying because all they are were instruments of inspiration. And the Bible says in verse number five, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Now remember, the reason why they were dwelling in Jerusalem. Devout men. They were dwelling in Jerusalem. I remember I told you before that this is one of the three compulsory feasts. And that's the reason why Jerusalem was packed with a lot of people because they had come, they had come to the temple. One in the spring, which is the Passover. One in the summer, which is the Shabbat. And one in the in the, in the, in the fall, which is, a, which is the tabernacle. So Jerusalem was packed with people. The Bible says, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews. Devout men from Every nation under heaven. That was the known, Roman known world then. And when this sound occurred. What sound? Let's be very careful to understand the sound that occurred. When this sound occurred. It was not the sound of tongues. It was the sound from heaven. We are about to talk about now. When this sound occurred. Remember the sound from heaven. Not the tongues. Because the purpose of the sound of heaven. Was to gather the people. And the purpose of the tongues. Was to convict them with the language. It was not the tongues that brought the people. It was heaven that brought the people. Tongues convicted them. And that's what the Bible says. You'll be witnesses. It was 
the, the sound from heaven that made men wonder what kind of a sound is this. So they all came to the place. The sound convocated the men. We believe that in this season of the church, what the church needs again is the sound of revival or the sound of heaven that brings convocation. It is heaven that convocates men. If I be lifted up, I draw men to myself. The reason why these men gathered what because there was a sound from heaven i believe that if there is anything the church needs in this day it's a sound from heaven if the church can understand that when the sound is released upon the church that men will gather and if there is anything i'm praying for our local house that god releases a sound at the brook place why that is the only way that men can convocate the way that men can gather together and praise the name of god is if we allow the sound not to come from our bellies but the sound to come from heaven and the bible says that they were they were they were all nations to the heaven and we when this sound occurred, the multitudes came together and were confused. Why were they confused? Because the Bible says, everyone heard them speak his own language. 120 people, I believe, they all had the tongues, right? Everyone who came, remember Jerusalem was packed with a lot of people. Everyone who came to that gathering heard their own language from 120 people. I'm talking about thousands you realize that because out of the thousands three thousand we are saved so you can imagine almost ten thousand people in that space and everyone who came there that's what the bible says everyone the bible means what it says and says what it means everyone who came there heard their language bible says they heard them speak in his own language then they were all amazed and marveled they were amazed blown away and marveled and said to one another look are not all these who speak Galileans, they were all Galileans. They would have said Galileans and Judean because Judas was from Judea, from Judea. But Judas is no longer counted among them. We have Matthias who is also Galilean. And Galileans had an accent. If you are from Galilee back in the day, you would know a Galilean because of their accent. They spoke a certain way. They pronounced words a certain way. They were in the northern part, very, very much into the metropolitan, cosmopolitan lifestyle. They were fishermen, they were traders, they were men of commerce. Unlike the Judeans, they were very much into religious practices. And these guys marveled and said, Are they not Galileans? Why are they speaking so clearly a language? And that's what prophecy does. My God, I wish you understood. If God takes over your voice, if you are a prophet and God takes over your voice, you pronounce things as if you're from the nation. My God. That's the reason. I remember one time I went to a, 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 a Russian speaking uh, Ukraine. And, and, then, and then I was pro prophesying. And I remember I was prophesying to someone their name as it's pronounced. And they asked me, how did you pronounce this name knowing the, the, the oath? And I said, I do not know if my tongue is overtaken, overpowered. God takes over. So the Bible said that these guys were Galileans, accent-speaking guys, but spoke precisely these languages. So it tells you that they didn't go to school to learn it. It has to be the power of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said, are these not Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we are born? In which we are born. Now this is the part. Now hear me. Bible students, for one second, hear me. They did not just hear their language. It is very possible that you might have a language and that you go to another nation and your language can be watered down. Because it's very easy for these Galileans to have a watered down language or for the guys hearing their language to have like a water. I don't speak my dialect, right? But I try to speak it and when I try to speak it, I'm just speaking nonsense that my mom says. But it's been watered down. I don't know it. But the Bible says that the language in which we are born, which means that they spoke the original oh, They did not just speak the modern language. They spoke the original language. They spoke the hometown language. It's like, it's like if you are from Jamaica here, it's like speaking patwa to the T. So they did not just speak a certain kind of language. They spoke the original, they spoke the motherland language. They had the right words. They had the right pronunciation. They had the right diphthongs. They had the right accent. The right you know, intonations. They spoke the language in which they were born. Not just the language they spoke. Because the language that they spoke would have been watered down. So they spoke the language of their motherland. My God. That's the precision. There are no coincidences with the Holy Ghost. There are no happenstances with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit will perfect everything it does. So much so that this guy spoke the language of their origin, their mother tongue. That's that's how precisely so that so that they can tell the people. Because it's very easy for us to learn a language. 
and I come from Benin City, Edo State, and I think I try to want to speak my dialect, but I can't, I can't do that. And I know that my dialect over the years is called etymology. The words have changed. And you realize that what used to be something now was not what it meant a few years ago. But these guys went to the foundation and spoke the original Patwa. Well, if they spoke Patwa, maybe they did. The Bible says, look, look at the people that were there. Parthians and Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians, Arabs. We hear them. I mean, they went across the continent, the known world back in the day. They've gone into the Babylonian world, into the Mesopotamian world, gone into the Greek world, they've gone into the Roman world. They spoke every language that needed speaking. But guess what you are saying? We hear them speaking in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, they were not saying the wonderful work of God. They were not saying the wonderful work of God. They were not saying the word. They were testifying of the wonderful work of God. Now, you might read this word, I might say, well, they are saying the wonderful work of God in this language. No. The wonderful work of God itself, they are saying how wonderful God is in these languages. So it is not a statement that is made. It is the content of the statement. So they were not really saying the wonderful work of God as an Amar. They were saying the wonderful work of God as Daba. What it means is that they are saying that God is wonderful, is excellent, is marvelous. He beat the heavens. So they were giving content. And that's the reason why these guys were blown away. Because they were speaking about the revelation of God in these languages. So these guys were not just speaking the wonderful, the wonderful work of God. It was the four or five syllables. They were testifying of the wonders of God in these languages with the right accent, with the right, with the right. So they're not saying the wonderful work of God as a statement. They were saying the wonderful work of God in Arab, in Christian, in Mesopotamian language, in the... And they were, they were, they were testifying, and that's the reason why these guys were blown away, because they were testifying about the wonderful work of what it was the content, not the statement. Are you following me? If you follow me, give me a thumbs up. Because a lot of people say, I see a lot, I see a lot of people teach and say they were saying the wonderful work of God. That's not what they were saying. They were not making a statement. They were, they were testifying of the wonders of God. So the people hear them say stuff like, you can imagine them hearing saying stuff like how precious God is, how amazing God is, how lovely God is, how God is the King of Kings, the Jesus. The so they were testifying of the wonders of God. It is the revelation and not the statement. That the Bible says that you the Bible says, in our own language, the Bible says verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this mean? I pray that revival come back to the church. That the unbelievers will look at the church and say, what would this, what could this mean? They will see young men and young women slain in the Holy Ghost speaking in powerful tongues. They will say revival break out where the crippled will rise up, the dead will rise up, where the sick will recover, where hospitals will be reduced. Why? Because the prophets and their and sons and daughters will go to the hospital and release men from their bondage. I believe the devil is going to come where the hospital bed will be empty because men will leave the church and go into the spaces and go to the prison door walls and speak revival. So much so that the unbelievers will say, what could this mean? What was the last time you heard that from a church? I'm, I'm not preaching. Oscar, behave. 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 I don't want to preach. So much so that these guys were speaking the wonders of God via this language. And this man says, what could this mean? W what is the meaning of this? Because this is beyond my supernatural, my, my natural conception. What could, and, and I pray for our churches that a day and time will come again. That when unbelievers come into the church and see God move. And see young people move in power. And see the crippled come out of their wheelchair. And see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. And see that those that have been cut the, the, uh, the, with the death certificate on their chest come back to life that the word will say what could this be we miss that word in the church we miss that word in the church i don't want to preach i want to teach 
Others mocking say they are full of new wine. This is intoxicating. This is beyond real. Bible says, but Peter, but Peter standing up. It was Peter who stood up. Because Jesus told Peter, be careful that sin that don't save you. But overcome this and then encourage your brethren. That's what Jesus told Peter. And Peter standing up with the eleven. Raised his voice. Peter raised his voice. Back in the day, standing and raising your voice is the work of a herald. A herald stands and speaks. So you speak because you want to announce. A herald announces. All the prophets stood and spoke. But Jesus sat and spoke because it was the message. Herod stood and spoke. Christ sat and spoke because he was the message. So Peter is about to announce something. The Bible says that this is Peter, Peter's first sermon. But Peter standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea, they mean they were all Jewish people. Remember, it was the time of the Pentecost. Jerusalem was packed. Men of Judea and all those who dwell in Jerusalem, very close. So the context here is Jewish. The first group of believers were Jewish. We tie our history to Judaism. So don't get it wrong. Men of Judea. Not men of England. Paul, Peter was eroding, making a message. But the message was to those of Judea. The Bible says in John 1 that he came to his own, his own received him not. But as many that received him to them, gave him power to become sons of God. You realize that this was an invitation to the world through the instrumentality of Israel. You hear me? The Bible says, men of Judea and those who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my, vo my words. Heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. Now, the Jewish clock starts from sun, sunset to sunrise. Not sunrise to sunset. The Jewish day starts from evening to morning. <laughs> and that's the reason why, if you calculate the crucifixion of Jesus, you realize that it's actually not a Sunday triumphal entry. It was a Monday. But again, let's leave that for another day without the time to argue that. The Jewish clock is from sunset to sunrise. We do sunrise to sunset. The Jewish clock starts in the evening. I start in the morning. <laughs> oh Lord, what you call evening? Anyway, let's let's just let's just do this. So the Bible says, for it's only the third hour that they start at six a.m. So seven, eight times. So this was nine a.m. The third hour is nine a.m. That's how you calculate. Nine a.m. So the, 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 the third hour of the day, so that day starts from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., right? The third hour, is, you have to count, six is third hour, you count 6, 7, 8, 9. When it's the ninth hour, you count 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. So the third hour of the day is plus 6. That's what it means, right? So this was 9 a.m. in the morning. So Peter said, they cannot be drunk because it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. And remember... 9 a.m. in the morning, 3 p.m., or 9 a.m., 12 noon and 3 p.m. are three times that they pray. So this is only 9 a.m. and you're not allowed to drink before you pray. So Peter is saying that by right of Judaic practices, they cannot even drink because it's just 9 a.m. in the morning. Because they have to be at the temple praying before they drink, not drink before they pray. So it doesn't make sense. The Bible says it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now hear me. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, you and I want to read what Peter said. Now, what you find in verse 17 now is not what you find. What, it's not the same word for word you find in Joel's writing. Now, I want you to flip your Bibles. Let's see what Peter said. And let's see what Joel said. Joel chapter number um, 2. All right. Joel chapter number 2. The prophet Joel. Now, their prophet said it. Joel chapter number 2. But Peter said here, Peter said, It shall come to pass in the last days, says God. Peter says, says God. Let's see what Joel says in Joel 2.28. Joel writes, It shall come to pass afterward. Who? Peter, Peter said, And it shall come to pass in the last day. So what Joel meant by afterward was the last day. Which is speaking of another dispensation. 
Now, Joel was writing this to his Jewish brethren, but, but including another people called the Gentiles. So, Joel says, it shall come to pass afterward, after the dispensation of the Jews. We, call, we have the dispensation of the church. Now, so, Bible says that, or the Holy Spirit, Bible says, and it shall come to pass after the dispensation of the Jews, says God. So, Peter completes the statement by saying, God said it. Even though Joel did not say God said it. Are you hearing me? So Peter was letting his brethren know. Remember, it was his Jewish brethren. The Bible says all men of Jerusalem or Judea and Jerusalem. So they know what Joel said already from their, from their law, from the prophets. But now Peter was telling them that it wasn't Joel who just made the word. God said, oh, I, wish. I wish you have an interlinear Bible. Bring them together. And, Joel, and Peter was saying, says God. Joel was saying afterward. So Peter was referencing Joel, but saying that it wasn't Joel who said it. God said it. Because their prophets thought that Joel made up the word. Even though they respected the prophet, they would have thought Joel was drunk. And that Peter told them that it wasn't Joel who from the word that God said. That's why in verse 17 of chapter number 2, Peter alluded or added, God said. So Joel writes that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, same thing. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Who are the sons and daughters? Hold on. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not just the Jews. So Joel was telling, yeah, church, Joel was telling the Jewish people that the spirit of the God, the spirit of the Lord will not just rest upon the Levites and the prophets of the Old Testament. It shall come upon all flesh. Back in the Bible, the back in the Old Testament dispensation, only the priests and the prophets, or only the priests and the Levitical tribe could prophesy. So it was not just the, the Jewish believers, not the Jewish brethren. It's a sect in the Jewish clan that can prophesy. Now, now, now Joel is telling them that the time is going to come after the dispensation of the Jews that God will pour his spirit upon not just the Jews, upon humanity. All flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So what Joel is saying that I'm not saying that prophetism will be taken from the Jewish people. I'm saying that prophetism will be included in the Gentile people. Let that sink in for a while. So no longer would you Jewish people feel like you're exclusive to prophetism. God is going to pour his spirit upon all flesh. Everyone that calls his name. It's no longer exclusive to a Jewish nation. It's not all flesh. That doesn't mean that God will stop you. With the, it, it means that if you are a Jew and a believer, you become a Jewish believer. You live Judaism, become a Christian, even though your ethnic background is Jewish. So the spirit of God is not just put on ethnicity, but on biology. Are you hearing? Joel is saying that the spirit of God will not just come upon ethnicity, it comes on biology. So this is an anthropological involvement. No longer an ethnic tribe, no longer a sect of people, no longer just God select, God select nation. But God said that in another and in that the coming dispensation, my spirit will not just be upon a Jewish nation only. I'm going to pour my spirit upon everyone who calls upon my name. So this was biological and not just et, 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 ethnical. Are you, are you following? The Bible says your your, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see vision, and, and also my maid servant. Now see what Peter said. I don't want to go beyond Peter. But Peter reiterated what 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 Joel said. I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Now, Joel said something profound. Now, Peter is not saying that this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Peter is saying this is the start of the prophecy. Because if you look through the prophecy in verse 30, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth. That is the time of Jacob's trouble. So in this prophecy that Joel is giving, Joel is saying that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon these new people called the church. But not only that, after the Spirit has come upon these people, another dispensation will come again called the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation. That is saying that I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned. Now, see what Joel is saying. Joel and Peter, we are saying the same thing. And, and Peter writes in verse 21 that it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
What Peter was saying is that after the pouring of the Spirit of God upon this new elect, select, uh, uh, collective, after the dispensation, then there's going to be the next dispensation called tribulation. But those who call the name of the Lord shall be saved. What Peter was saying is that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon both Jews and Gentiles in Christ. But those that don't have the Spirit of the Lord will go through this fire and smoke. Because from in verse, in, in, if you look at what Joyce says, Joyce says, um, uh, in, verse, in verse 32 of Joyce chapter number 2, And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, whosoever, whoever, not just the Jew, but whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Meaning, therefore, that what Joel is saying is that the Spirit of the Lord will be poured upon a new set of people called the Ecclesia. And that includes you who believes in Jesus. And after that, those who do not believe in the Spirit of the Lord, those who do not call on the name of the Lord, those ones will go through the fire and the blood. That's what the Bible says. Because it talks about how there will be wonders in heaven. This is the tribulation. So those who do not call upon the name of the Lord would have to go through the tribulation. But those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Therefore, the Spirit of the Lord is coming upon a new collective. And this new collective are of the Spirit because they have called on the name of the Lord. And because they have called on the name of the Lord, they will not go through the fire and the blood. Because they are saved. Therefore, salvation is those who call upon the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible says, those who call upon the name. So, 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 so Peter writes in verse 21, It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <coughs> Are you hearing? So Peter was bringing two dispensations as Joel brought two dispensations. But the difference between the Spirit and the fire and the blood is that those who call upon the name of the Lord have the Spirit of God. They have been baptized. Do you understand what that means now? They have been baptized into Christ as the new collective. But those who don't have the, who have been called the name of the Lord, they're going to have this tribulation, which is, Bible says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and moon and, and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Does that make sense? Are you following me, church? <laughs> is this blessing someone already? Are you being blessed so far? I want to hear from you. Let me see the comment section. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Yes, you are blessed. Yes, you are blessed. I see you. I see all of you. I'm reading your comments. Thank you. Yes, you are blessed. You are blessed. Yeah. You're blessed. So we keep reading. We keep reading the scripture. We keep reading. We keep reading. The Bible says, then in verse 22, see what Peter said. Remember, Peter became an herald, and herald will stand and speak. The message sat and received. And that's why the Bible says Jesus sat down, Hebrews 10, and now still sitting down on the right hand of the Father. The Bible says, men of Israel, in verse 22 of chapter number 2 of the book of uh, Acts, my God, we're still in chapter 2. That's my life today. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, oh my God, a man attested, he calls him a man, a man attested by God. To you by miracle. So God proved Jesus. Dokimazo. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. Which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know. So, so Peter was saying, you guys knew. Men of Judea, you knew that this man walked miracle signs and wonders. And God did miracle signs and wonders. And you also know. The Bible said you also know him. Being delivered by, and by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God, so Peter acknowledged the fact that Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. The Bible says in 24, whom God raised up, it was God who raised Jesus, who God raised up, having loosed the pain of death, having loosed the pains of death. Because it was not possible that he should be held by death. Death could not hold him. Because he had no sin nature. Death could not hold Jesus. I love the song. Death could not hold him. Death could not hold him. Because these Jewish people would they the Bible says. For David, whoo, 
<laughs> because these Jewish people, they understood from their law that David was a king that they venerated. But they also understood that there were some statements that they didn't understand that David made. Bible says, for, for David says concerning him, for David said concerning Jesus. So what David said. For David, let's go back again to the book of uh, Acts 2 because I'm, I'm still here. I'm, I'm going to open my Bible. Acts chapter number 2. We are in verse 26 now. Right. For David said, I foresaw. Where, where, where am I now? That's it here. I foresaw. Now this is Psalm 16. If you have a Bible, quickly. It's Psalm 16, 8 to 11, right? So picked up again as quoted the prophet Joel. Now, Peter is quoted again, their king. <laughs> and, and, and he wrote, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. Now, this was David speaking. And David is saying, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand and that I may not be shaken. David was saying that the Lord was at his right hand. We'll find out who that Lord is in a moment. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Why? Because the Lord was on his right hand. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in, in Hades. Which is Sheol in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew. You will not allow your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. And make, full, make me full of the joy of your presence. That's what he wrote. Ooh. So they are so he is quoting the King David. Peter was quoting what David said in Psalm 16 that David was addressing the Lord. But now that, that Peter was trying to present that Lord as not Yahweh. That Lord as Jesus. David acknowledged the Lord. But the Jews had a problem who the Lord is because they thought that Lord is the Yod Heva Day. But, you, but what Peter was saying is that even David acknowledged Jesus as Lord. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 29. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. Are you following me? Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. I'm still there. I'm reading the scripture with you. That's where we are. Of the patriarch David. We are here. We are there. We are there. Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. So he's bringing the, the, the Davidic discourse. If you are, um, spend the time to study 2 Samuel chapter number 7 to understand the, the Davidic covenants. So Peter is about to touch some things that you might just overlook. And, and he says that he is both dead and buried. What was Peter trying to say? That Jesus died and was resurrected, but David was dead. And buried that this Jesus is more than David because these Jews venerate David, they love David, he's their king. But Peter was saying that that David, that patriarch David, died and buried, but Jesus died and rose up. That's what he's trying to say. He's saying, and his tomb is with us today. The tomb of David is with them at that time. Look at verse number 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sown with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Jesus would raise... <sighs> Let's read it again. Peter was given a statement that Jesus, that God would raise Jesus to sit on the throne of David. Ah. <sighs> Peter was saying to the Jewish believers, according to the flesh, not spirit, it's not spiritual, according to the flesh, that God would raise Jesus up to sit on the throne of David. Let's read again verse number 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, Jesus is from the line of David. Legally from the line of Solomon, his father Joseph, and the, mother, the, the, and the mother's line through Nathan, sons of Solomon. That according to the flesh, that God would raise up Christ to sit on David's throne. We are here. 
verse number 30. This speaks of the millennium. That Jesus will sit on the throne of David. And that's why when Gabriel came to Mary and said to Mary that she will bring forth the Messiah and he will sit on the throne of his father David. That is the scripture. As far as we know, Jesus never sat on the throne when he walked on the face of the earth. So Peter was assuring them of a second coming when Jesus will sit on the throne because he's alive. Are you, are you, are you hearing? There was no throne in the time of Jesus. It was the Roman who ruled. There's no throne yet. But the throne is going to come. And that's what Peter was saying. Peter was saying that Jesus will sit on the throne. There was no place in history. There was no place in the Bible that tells us that Jesus sat on the throne. He never sat on the throne. He overturned tables at the temple. But he will sit on the throne. That is an eschatological future. So Peter was speaking to them about the millennium. Hmm. Because these Jews had no clue about the millennium. But Peter was inferring because the place they found the millennium is actually in Revelation chapter number 20. But this millennium is a mystery to them. But Peter was speaking as a herald because it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So Peter was saying that Jesus will sit on the coming throne. The throne of David. That's what he says there. Bible said he for saying this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. Who? Who? David. That his soul was not left in Hades. Nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus. Now Peter was speaking to the Jewish listeners. This Jesus God raised up. Of which we are all witnesses. We all are witnesses. We are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God. Jesus is at the right hand of God. But Jesus will sit on the throne of David on the earth. Jesus is at the right hand of God with the Father. But he will sit on the, on the throne of David on the earth. Having received from the Father the promise of the Spirit, he poured out this which you now see. Catch this. Therefore, being exalted, Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God, and received from the Father the promise of the Spirit. Jesus received the Holy Ghost from the Father and gave to the church. So the outpour of the Spirit is God giving Jesus his Spirit. A lot of people call it procession. But Jesus took the Spirit from the Father and poured on the church. My God, I wish you, can, I wish you have a clear picture of that. That God gave Jesus the Spirit and Jesus gave the church the Spirit. Just like God gave Jesus the revelation and Jesus gave an angel and the an angel gave to John and John gave to the seven, the seven leaders of the churches. It's called this doctrine of transmission tells me that the spirit was given to us by Jesus, by God. You know what I'm saying? You should be excited right now. This was Christ taking the spirit from the father and giving to the church. He pulled out this, which you now see and hear. So Peter was saying, what you are hearing and what you are seeing is a gift that the father gave the son and the son gave the church. So the spirit is a gift. God gave Jesus the spirit. And Jesus gave the church the spirit. And now what you guys hear and see is an outward expression of that gift. So the spirit, the spirit, the Holy Spirit is a gift from the father to the son and the son to the, to the sons. Say it again. The gift of the spirit is the gift of the father to the son and from son to the sons. Are you there? In verse 24. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but said of himself, oh Lord, David never went to heaven. But David said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. The Lord said to my Lord, that is Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until. Sit at my right hand. Ah, I will explain this in a moment. There's no time. Sit at my right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, not the throne. He will sit on the throne. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus had not made the enemies the footstool yet because he hadn't had his own seat yet. So what, what Peter is saying, what, what David is saying, 
The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Footstools are only given when you have a throne. Jesus at the moment is on the seat of his father, not his own throne. So there is no footstool at the moment. So the Bible says that sit here, not while I make your enemies your footstool, but till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus is still at the right hand of God for the church. <laughs> Follow me, church. Till. So that's a time frame. So Jesus will remain at the right hand of God until his enemies are made his footstool. Meaning, therefore, Jesus will be at the right hand of God until he sits on his own throne where his own enemy becomes his footstool. <sighs> In fact, let me take you to a Bible college for one minute. The word, the Lord said to my Lord, Yod -Hey -Vavay said to, is, the, is what Yahweh says to the Lord. Is Yahweh says to Adonai. Let's let's look at let's look at um let me take you back to study. Let me draw this for you. Okay. Alright. Let me clean this. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, I will make you enemy of food. Let me let me let me let me let me the word the Lord said to my Lord. How is said in the Greek? In the in the Septuagint. The Septuagint is called the LXS. 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 Let me get this pen. This pen is falling on the floor. One second, guys. I'm going to get my other pen. It's on the floor. It writes better. One second, guys. All right. The LXS is called the Septuagint. Septuagint. The Septuagint is a kind of a Bible that outlives the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is what most people use. It's the Old Testament Bible. That came out in 9 AD. But the Septuagint was about 3 BC before Jesus. It's about 1,000 years before the Masoretic text. So a lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of um, Jesus' um, uh, words are from the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is actually the LXS, which is the Roman room numeral for 70. And this was when uh, a guy called Ptolemy, Ptolemy, P-T-E, L O M Y. Ptolemy was one of Alexander the Great's generals. So Alexander, before he died at about 30 or 29, about 30, he had four generals. So before he died, he split his kingdom into four. One part of the kingdom was given to Lysimachus, one part of the kingdom was given to Seleucus, one part of the kingdom was given to Cassander, and one was given to Ptolemy. So Ptolemy wanted to Hellenize the world. So what he did, he took 70 guys who were actually uh, remember the word was Hellenized. So he took 70 guys and said to them to translate the Bible from the Old Testament Volage into the Greek Bible. So the Old Testament Greek is called the Septuagint. The Old Testament is called the Volage, but the, the, the Old Testament is called the Masoretic Text, MT. People use that. But Jesus used the Septuagint because the Masoretic Text came out at about 9 AD or something. So when the Bible said, the Lord said to my Lord, you know, very important. I want to, I want to put this, put this to, to you right now. The Lord said to my Lord that you read now. Let's go back again to um, uh, verses number uh, 34. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he said to himself, The Lord said to my Lord. This is David speaking. What does David say mean by the Lord said to my Lord? What does that mean? In the Hebrew, the Lord said to my Lord is yod hey vav hey say to Elohim, him. Right? So the, the Lord said to my Lord is this. is the word yod it's yod, that is what hey. Hey is like breath. Yod means power. Or yod. Yod means power or strength. No, means power. Yod hey. Vav. Vav hey. Now, Hebrew means from right to left. So yod hey. Vav hey. So yod hey. Vav hey. This is yod. Y O D. Yod hey. This is hey. H E H. Which is like a breath. This is vav. Which is like a strength. And this is hey. So yod hey. Vav hey. Is the word for Yahweh. Yod Hey Vav Hey. Y H W, which is called Yod Hey Wah Hey or Yod Hey Vav Hey, right? So this is Yod Hey Vav Hey. Let me write it again for those of you that want to write, but you don't need it now because you're not um, doing Greek um, Hebrew study. Okay. So the Bible says, The Lord said to my Lord, I will show you something that's very that's 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 profound. This is the word Yod, Yod Hey Vav Hey. Now this is Yod Hey Vav Hey, right? This is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Jehovah. Jehovah Lord. This is Yod Hey Vav Hey. 
Now, this is another word now that will blow your mind. It's also the word for Lord. Now, this is the word. It comes in as Aleph. Aleph is this. Aleph, Dalet. Dalet is like a D. Uh, Vav and Yod. This one is called Aleph, A-L-E-F. This one is called Dalet, D-A-L-E-T. And this one is called uh, Vav and Yod. Now, let me just explain this right now because you don't have, I don't have the time to explain this. Now, in Hebraism, I believe you can see my screen. In Hebraism, oh, in Hebraism, this Yod Hey Vav, when, when you say, the Lord said to my Lord, that it's a word that's, that's going to be in the middle here. So, this is the Lord said to my Lord. Said to my Lord. Now, Yod, oh Lord, are you are you following me? The word Yod is a uh, Jesus saying that not not even a Yod or your Titu, every word of a Lord. This will even make you have a precise appreciation for the text. The Yod Hey Vav Hey speaks of God Jehovah, which is that which is called Tetramagaton. It's Jehovah says to Adonai. But that word Adonai becomes possessive. Oh my God. It becomes possessive because of this yod at the end. So this possessive word, which is the yod there, makes it my Lord. So, David was saying that, David was saying, Jehovah Yahweh says to my Adonai. So therefore, David was saying that God the Father told God the Son, my God. That's the reason why when Jesus in the gospel said to them, what do you think David meant by the Lord said to my Lord? They were all confused. Because how can David have a Lord? And David says, the Lord said to my Lord. And this Lord here made, made this order Adonai possessive. So David was possessing the Adonai. Are you following me? So the word Yod Eivave is God the Father, which is Yahweh. The Lord, David was saying, the Lord Say to my Lord. So David called the Adonai his Lord. That was the point that Peter was trying to prove to them. That Jesus is David's Lord. Because even David said that in Psalm 110. That Jesus is his Lord. He didn't say that yod hey vav is his Lord. He used the word the Yod as it stands in the end of that word. The end of that verb. Because you have the word Aleph Dalet Vav Yod. Which means Adonai, right? He's saying that because of that last yod, it makes the Adonai possessive. Which means that David is saying that the Lord said to my Lord. So my Lord is Jesus. So David, Peter was saying to them, Peter was saying to them, what do you think Peter meant, uh, David meant by his Lord? Because Jesus is his Lord. Let's go back to the scriptures. Let's go back to the scriptures. Therefore, the Bible says, Sit at my right hand. Now, hear me. It was David who was telling us that God told Jesus. So the Adonai, so the, 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 the Jehovah Yahweh, David was saying that God the Father told my God the Son to sit at his right hand. To sit. So David was being a prophet. And that's what the Bible says prophetically. David being a prophet. Was saying to his people that God the Father said to God the Son, that is his own Lord, to sit at his right hand, that, that the Father's right hand, when? Until he makes the Son's enemies his footstool. What does that mean? David was saying that Jesus is on the throne of his Father, not on his own throne at the moment. It's at the right hand of the Father, not the throne. The throne is different than the church from the right hand. Jesus will sit on his own throne. But before he sits on his own throne, he has to be at the right hand. So Jesus is at the right hand at the moment and will be on the throne in the, in the future. He will be on the throne in the millennium. But right now he's not on the throne. He's on his father's throne or his father's right hand. The Bible says, sit here until, not while. This word will change the game for you. This word till. It didn't say, sit here while I make your enemies. 
Because Jesus is not on the throne at the moment. Jesus has to sit on the throne to have a footstool. Because kings have footstool. At the moment, Jesus is at the right hand. So, Jesus is at the right hand of God for the church. By the time that Jesus will come, he will sit on a throne. That will be from Revelation chapter number 6. Who is the lamb that is worthy to open the scroll? The lamb that was slain. Are you hearing me, church? So, at the moment, his enemies are not under his feet. His enemies are not his footstool yet. Because his throne is not on the earth yet. So, that word till is given to dispensation between the church and the tribulation. So while the church is on the face of the earth, Jesus is on the right side of God making intercession for our, for the church. But the time will come when he finishes the intercession that he will sit on the throne on the earth and make the enemies the footstool. If you are following me, give me a thumbs up. I need you to follow. I promise you it will change the game. So even Peter was alluding that, that David may not even know what he was saying at the time. But David was speaking into the eschatological future that Jesus will have his own throne on the earth and that throne will be the throne of David on the face of the earth. It is a Davidic throne that will be on the face of the earth and it is from that throne that Jesus will judge the nations. We need this, we need this chapter, chapter 2 today. <laughs> Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this, that he's speaking to Jewish people, remember. Everything here is Jewish. It was the time of Pentecost. The house was full. Therefore, let it be known, all the house of Israel, that assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucify both Lord and Christ. Why Lord and Christ? He didn't just say Lord, but Lord and Christ. Brought in the word despotes and Christos. The, the, the anointed one. So Jesus is the anointed Messiah. So he's telling them that this Jesus that you crucified is the definite article. The anointed Christ. The anointed Messiah. Bible says in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were caught to the heart. You hear me? They were, they were not gnashing their teeth. Gnashing their teeth was for sorrow. They were caught because they were being repentant. They gnashed their teeth to kill Stephen. But now they were cut to heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, remember, Peter is not the way to salvation. And that's what they say to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? He called them brethren. The men were cut to heart. Peter had for once preached a sermon that the men were cut to heart. Peter before, in the gospel time, whatever he preached was always a problem. He always had a mistake when he preached, when he taught, when he asked a question. But because Peter has been endued with power, the Bible says that he preached this one sermon and the men were caught to heart. They were convicted and they said to the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? I pray that that level of revival come back to the church. That after preaching, we're not there as celebrity, celebrity pastors. We're not there to show our blings and our live and our, our good lifestyle and our, our dress. No, we're there to preach a message and the men will say, what shall we do? I believe in a heart-cutting message. I don't know about you. Go down the days where we impress people with great grammars. Go down the days we impress people with great theology. I believe that these are the days of a heart-cutting message. Yeah. A heart-cutting message that men will say, what shall we do? What can we do to be saved? A heart-cutting message. What can we do to be saved? The Bible says in verse 30, then Peter said to them, repent. The word repent, metanoia, which means to go back. It's not metamelo mind, which means regret. The word repent means change your mind. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This gift of the Holy Spirit is not, you know what I mean? It is to receive the gifts. The gift of the Holy Spirit is called eternal life. Remember, God gave the gift to Jesus. Jesus gave the gift to the disciples. So if you repent, you will have this gift as well. It's called eternal life. This is not a pneumatological gift. It's not a gift of the, of the Spirit you find in 1 Corinthians. It's a gift of eternal life. So let's make a distinction that what Peter was saying here, because a lot of people have preached that they were baptized and they received, it was not a supernatural pneumatological gift, but it's a gift of eternal life. All right? 
The Bible says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of eternal life. That is the first gift. Before the secondary gift, that is the gift of His Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit means the gift of God to you. The gifts of from the Holy Spirit. Now, now in, German, in German rule, that's what you got off and from. The gift of the Holy Spirit means that the Father is gifting us with His gift called the Holy Spirit. However, the gift from the Holy Spirit is called pneumatological gift. So the Father gave us a gift, but in that gift are gifts. But when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive life. And in that life are different gifts, okay? So the Father did not just give us spiritual gifts. It gave us the gift that has spiritual gifts. Does that make sense? It gave us eternal life. And once we receive eternal life, we receive the gift from His Spirit also. And the Bible says in verse 30, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call out. Now, what he's saying that He's talking about the laws of transition. This gift is for you Jewish people and to your children and not just to your children but as many as far as God will call. You shall be witnesses first in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the Eschatos. So we're saying to them that this gift of the Spirit is for all mankind. It's a biological adoption. It's not just ethnic. It's for every mankind. In verse 40, wow, we're almost there. In verse 40, the Bible says, and with many other words, it testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this, what, pistis, yeah, from this perverse generation. So Peter calls that generation a perverse generation. Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly, hear me, church, those who gladly received his words. Therefore, there were people that did not receive his words, just like there were people. Who thought that they were drunk. But those who gladly received these words were baptized. Means that they are baptized into the family of the body of Christ. We are baptized and on that. Now they were baptized. Now this is by immersion. Now there were some people who feel like this was not the upper room anymore. Because there was no way that 3,000 people could be baptized. But there were people like myself who believe that this could have been the upper room experience too. However, that the people waited in queue and was baptized. Maybe they might have like five different basins or pools. It doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be a river. It could be possible they might have like five stations or 20 stations and people were baptized. Okay. The Bible says that 3,000 souls were added to them. Hold on. 3,000 souls were added to the church. Therefore, if 3,000 souls were those who gladly received, it's possible that there might be 10,000 people there and 3,000 people were caught to heart. It's interesting that Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, preached one message. 3,000 people were saved. Is it not funny that today we preach 3,000 messages and get only one man saved? Is it not funny that we live in a day and age where we do all the gymnastics and all the theology and preach and only one man is saved? But Peter, the Bible says, okay. but Peter preached one sermon and 3,000 were saved. But hold on, that's not the point. In the giving of the law, now this will blow your mind, in the giving of the law, something happened. In the giving of the Spirit, something happened. When Moses came down from the mount, and realized that his people had built a golden calf. 3,000 people were killed. In Exodus chapter 32, in the giving of the law, 3,000 people were killed. In the giving of the Spirit, 3,000 people were saved. I do not believe there is any coincidence in God's prophetic timing. I believe that everything that is there, it's there by deliberate design. These same people read in the law. Because remember, the giving of the law was at Shavuot. The giving of the Spirit was at Shavuot. In the giving of the law, Moses came back frustrated that his brother had led a troop of people who disobeyed God by building a golden calf. Because of the anger, the Bible says... 3,000 people were slain. Slayed. 
But in the giving of the Spirit, it's interesting how 3,000 people were added. The law caves. The letter caves, rather. But the Spirit gave it life. Say it again. The letter. Moses came back with the letters. The law. The letters kill. But the Spirit gives life. That's what the Bible says. So if the Bible says that the letter kills and the Spirit gives life, it means that in Exodus chapter number 32, when Moses came back from the mount with those tablets, he struck the tablet. 3,000 people died. But this same guy by the name of Peter, which means Petra, Petrus, Petra, Petrus, the church and the blood, he preached one sermon and 3,000 people were saved. This is grace at work. And I think if I have that same scripture open up, opened up, I'm not sure that's the one, but let's look at the scripture opened up. The Bible says, 3,000 souls were added. And the Bible says, And they continued. Who? The people there. They continued steadfastly. Who continued? The people that were added. And I, I tried to tell the church that Luke was writing. If, if you understand, the, now Luke's writing is the most perfect Greek writing ever. So precise that historians and, 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 and literists say that this has to be inspired an amazing literature in verse 42 and they continue who continued the three thousand souls so we see a progression from the early apostles to the new converts and this convert continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrines so when the apostles at when peter had preached the sermon what luke is not telling us that these three thousand people were added to the church they went through Bible study or they went through discipleship. What Peter, what Luke is telling us right now after conversion is discipleship. My problem with the church, especially the charismatic church, we miss it. There is first conversion, discipleship, and then administration of gifts. But what we have today are conversion, administra administration of gifts, no discipleship. They continued. But I tell us, they, they, they continued, they continued with the apostles' doctrines. The word doctrine means didactic, didactic teachings. So they continued with the apostles' teachings. They continued in fellowship. They, they, didn't, they didn't just go away, you know. The local church is for your discipline. You need a local church for your discipline. It is in the local church, you cannot grow in your walk with God outside of the local church. You'll be, stun you be stunted. The purpose of a local church is to be deliberate about your spiritual journey. What we are doing right now is for a local church. Breaking our bread can be seen in two ways. Breaking our bread could mean communion or it could mean eating. But a lot of theologians believe it's communion, right? Whichever way is okay. Whether it's communion or whether it's practically eating by food is fine. But a lot of theologians believe is the they, they continue with the apostolic teaching on communion. Everything here is that what is the model of the apostolic church. So the apostolic church is a church that believes in doctrines, in fellowship, in communion, and in prayers. These four things are what makes an apostolic house an apostolic house. Now you might say that breaking of bread can mean free food. Fine, let's eat food then. But I realize that they continued, but steadfastly. Parakateros, they continued steadfastly. In the apostles' teachings. So they didn't, they didn't waver. They were steward of this revelation. They didn't waver. They, they held this truth. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. In fellowship. You cannot don't despise the fellowship of the brethren. Stop doing, I will study the Bible on my own from my house. No, you need fellowship. Koinonia. Right. So the Bible says in prayers, then fear came upon every soul. Now, fear did not just come upon those who were converted. Every soul. Bible says, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. The apostles were known for wonders and signs. And one of the greatest wonders and signs of an apostle, ladies and gentlemen, hear me, or the apostles, were the grace of mission and convertism. The Bible says, now all who believed were all together up together and add all things in common. All do believe. There we have the name believers. 
They will believe the message of the gospel. The Bible says they had all things in common. And how did Peter, how did Peter convince them with the gospel? It didn't, Peter did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He didn't have the, the New Testament. How then did Peter convince them? How were they saved? How were they saved? How were the people saved? Peter only referenced two people. Number one, Joel. Number two, David. My question to challenge you is this. How did the Old Testament saints get saved when they had no New Testament? See, the dilemma we have today are people who have the complete gospel but cannot bring men to Christ. Can you preach Jesus from the Old Testament alone? That is the challenge that everyone needs to ask themselves today. Can I preach Jesus only? Can I preach Jesus only from the Old Testament? Is it possible? I know the maturity of your Bible study knowledge. If you are able to bring Jesus, if you are able to preach Jesus from the Old Testament writings. Because all Peter did was pull from Joel and pull from David. And 3,000 people were saved. Let me challenge you today. Can you bring men to Christ? Can you bring your Hebrew or Jewish man to Christ? Not using the Gospels. Forget Matthew to Revelation. Can you bring men to Christ just using, let me church, just using the Old Testament writings? That is the greatest challenge you can ever have. There were people, and there were people who invalidate the Montanists, who invalidate the, 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 the Old Testament. But you realize that Peter stood up there and he routed the message of the kingdom by making, bringing 3,000 men to the faith, not by preaching Paul's message, not by preaching Jesus' message, but by preaching their own Hebrew Bible. Is it making sense to you? Because a lot of times we read the Old Testament, we read it like a literature, like, oh, I can't find Jesus. I mean, Peter, who we believe that he always made a mistake when he spoke, was inspired of the Lord and was able to bring men to the knowledge of light. The Bible said they came together and Peter only did this via the Old Testament. Ask yourself a question. Can you get a Jewish man, a Jewish, sto straight, stoic, orthodox, orthodox Jew, can you get them saved? Just from the Old Testament, can you? The Bible says, Now all who believe we are together, they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all. The church was so united that there was no poverty. Those who had came and divided amongst all, and everyone had. The Bible says, and everyone, and as everyone had a need, in verse number 40, 46, now, this is the part. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Now, remember, the temple was the place of worship. Continuing daily. Why is this thing? Oh oh they continued daily with one accord in the temple. One accord in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house. Breaking bread from house to house then could possibly mean that they commune from house to house or the fellowship and i believe this thing this is the thing yeah the church started from house to house that doesn't mean they have a temple but the bible says that they continually with one according so there was a temple meeting and there was a house to house so for the brook place i've decided to do what you call a cell group now back in the day there was no internet there was no zoom now the purpose of our cell group i'm going to design our cell group meetings is to put people in groups I meet it meet on Zoom. Choose whatever day you want to meet and meet on Zoom. Maybe a day that you feel like you're and have a leader and walk through this Bible study. The Bible says not we will come to church on Sunday. We have this big thing on the altar. The pulpit, the preacher preaching. But your growth, I realize that I've done house to house or I've done what you call them Bible study groups. And my growth, I tell you, I can track my growth to the Bible study groups. Does that make sense? I would say house to house and they ate their food with gladness. So they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So it tells me that the breaking of bread could possibly be me mean eating food together. That's what, that's what the writer wrote here. Bible says that they're breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness. Therefore, 
I believe that what Paul meant by they continue steadfastly in, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, is food. And the Bible says, with a simplicity of heart. There was no one trying to be the leader. There was no one trying to be the GO, the general overseer. They had a simplicity of heart. So, Brookies, we might do an online as well. We'll put out a form for online as well because it's going to be on Zoom. We might extend this to online as well. So, probably might put that something. I'll speak with the media team to put that something there to have like a group meeting. So, maybe once a week or once, but just something uh, for Bible study just to grow as we navigate Acts. I want you guys to come together and study. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who have been saved. One of the things I like, I love about the book of Acts chapter number two is that Peter stood up and spoke the word of the Lord. And the Bible says that numbers were added daily. I believe there is something about House to house fellowship, house to house meeting, group meeting, or something, something like that. But the good thing about it is that people we are added daily, so the church grew. All right. Now I remember I told you it's going to do two chapters today. Now if you are tired, you want to come back and watch this. I promise you, I'm going to do chapter number three now. Okay. And I'll watch chapter number three in one hour, and then you can go. I'm holding you today. Mm. You're going to stay here today. All right. Quickly. Act chapter number three. I promised you, I'm gonna do it. All right, all right. Take a stretch. Stretch your legs for another. Stretch your legs for another um, two minutes, and then we'll come back to Act chapter number Act chapter number three. All right. When you are ready, we are ready to do that. All right, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Say to your neighbor, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> Say to your neighbor, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. We are excited. We want to do, just in case you cannot watch with us chapter number three, you watch again, maybe tomorrow. If you have your Bibles quickly, we want to do chapter number three. All right. The reason why, cause I, don't, I believe that if we do a chapter a day, we don't, we don't have the time to finish this thing, even in, even in, this is 28 chapters. That's 28 Sundays. That's almost half the year. <laughs> we don't have the time for that. And as we go further, it gets deeper. So um, I'll try to do two chapters per when we meet. Sundays might be hard because Sundays is a lot of things going on. But on Tuesdays, we can exegete the scripture. Um, but if this is blessing you already, you know, a lot of you, I know a lot of you want this. I, I, I've, I, I mean, I've received emails upon D, DMs and please. So you ask for this, now you're having it. Only on the Brook Place. You Brook Place, yo. <laughs> I'm crazy. <laughs> Honestly, um, we are we are blessed to be members of the Brook Place. I'm not trying to sound, fetish, uh, 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 sound funny now, but we are blessed to be at the Brook Place. So get this level of meat. And this is just introduction. Um, because what you don't know is that if the Lord allows me to do verse by verse commentary of the entire New Testament, I would do that. But I want to see how this works for us as a church using Acts first. Maybe from Acts, we'll go to Romans. Maybe from Romans, we'll go to Corinthians. Who knows? We never know. But let's see how this, um, how this will, will go. All right. So quickly, we're in Acts chapter number three. Now, Acts chapter number two ended with people were added daily to the church. So the church was growing. But what it says. 
Look at look at Acts chapter number two again. Um, my Bible said this something profound in Acts chapter number two. It ended by saying, "And the Lord added to the church." This is the first time you had the word "church" in the New Testament. So the Lord added to the church. Now, if you look at that same verse, praise in verse number forty-six, they went to the temple, but now God added to the church. The church was not the building, so the church meant at the temple. Oh Lord, help me. Because in our minds, when you hear the word temple, what comes to mind naturally is Judaism. They still met at the temple, but they were the church. So the temple is not the church. The church met at the temple. You need to write that down. The church met at the temple. But the Bible says that, but they continued daily with one accord in the temple. The temple was a place, a physical place of seer, but the church is not a physical place. The church were the people. So the church met at the temple. So the Bible says that so continuing daily in one accord in the temple. The temple was the place of meeting. In the temple, breaking bread and from house to house, they ate their food and gladness and spirits of heart, praising God with da, 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 and the Lord added to the church. Basically, the Lord added people to the body and they met in the temple. A lot of you read the word temple in the, in the, in the scripture. And what comes to mind is that the temple is the middle place for Jews. Not necessarily so. Because these new Christians also met at the temple. Alright? So the Bible says, so God increased the numbers. People we have been saved. And God gave them grace. Chapter number 3 of the book of... Let's go. Chapter number 3 of the book of... Um, are we there? We are there. Alright, so we are there in chapter number 3. Check yourself. How many verses does he have? My God, it has only, that's not bad, 26. We can rush 26. We can do 26 quickly. Let me move this my picture here quickly. All right. Now, Peter and John. It's interesting how you find Peter and John. And one of the greatest mistakes a lot of people make every time is that they call Peter the hard one and John the quiet. And I say to them, no. Actually, the only time we find Peter as hard was when he cut someone's ears when Jesus was arrested. But Jesus called John the sons, John, 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 John and James, James and John, sons of thunder. So we, in our mind, we think, we think Peter is the hard one and John is the beloved one. But John is called the beloved, but is the beloved son of thunder. <laughs> so really, really, John is not really as quiet as you think. A lot of you are saying that your apostle, I'm your Peter. I'd rather with John. I need, I need sons of thunder in my life. <laughs> Let's keep reading. The Bible says that now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. So they didn't stop the practice. They were still Jews. They, they were Jews, so they understood the fulfillment of the practice. Now they didn't go to the temple as just as as um, Judaic believers. They went to the temple as Christians. I'll tell you the reason why. Now they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. They didn't go at the hour of oblation. Now, the hour of prayer is always at 3 p.m. I'll show you in a moment. So the three times, 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m. Bible says it was the ninth hour. I mentioned to you before, to calculate the ninth hour, you have to add six, add six to the number. So, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3. So, the ninth hour was 3 p.m. Follow me. They went to the temple at the hour. The Bible says at the hour. That word at speaks of a... It's, it's a uh, 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 definite article at, 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 the, at the hour of prayer precisely that place but that's not the point the ninth hour is always 3 o'clock 30 minutes before 3 o'clock the lamb is slain 30 minutes before 3 o'clock the priest will inspect the lamb and slay so the time of oblation and the sacrifices was done 30 minutes to 3 o'clock so at 2.30, the people met and did their inspection. Then at 3 o'clock, they met for prayers. Now this is the part. John and Peter, Peter and John knew that Jesus had fulfilled that inspection by being the crucifixion. So they no longer partook of that sign. They came for prayers. Are you following me, church? Because they went to the uh, there's the hour of prayer and there's the hour of oblation. You find it in Daniel chapter number 9, I believe. That chapter number... Uh, six, I believe. So they didn't go to the temple at the hour of sacrifice or the rites or the rituals, which was 
half an hour before the prayer time. They skipped the half an hour and they went at the right time of prayer because they understood that that is not behind them. They understood that Jesus had fulfilled the sacrifice. So there was no need for them to go to the temple at 2.30. So they went to the, the hour of prayer, which is 3 o'clock. Follow me. We're, gonna, we're going somewhere. Because they, they, they are teaching us the fulfillment, the, the prophetic fulfillment of the, the, the Judaic practices as we fulfilled in Christ. But prayer continues. The Bible says, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Now, we understand they be given power. And that's the reason why, when Luke arranged it, Luke arranged the supernatural gift of the Spirit is given to us first for mission and then for miracles. It is never miracles before mission. It's always mission before miracles. That's the reason why you realize that the miracle signs and wonders was getting 3,000 people saved. Now it's interesting that after 3,000 people have been saved, now we see miracles. I believe that a church that will that see miracles is the one that focuses on mission. Are you following me, church? Miracles are amazing. I mean, I mean, miracles are great, amazing, but we will not get miracles until we first focus on mission. So we understand from scriptures that Luke was emphasizing on Mission, 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 then miracles. So chapter number two, we see that giving of the Spirit was first for the mission to get people saved. And now people have been saved with mission, now we need miracles. So the Bible says that there was a man who was lame from his mother's womb, who was carried, whom they laid daily. So if this man laid daily, it meant that the disciples would see him every day. Why? Because they came, the Bible says they came to the temple daily. That's what the Bible says as we end at chapter number 2. So they laid the man daily at the gates of the temple called Beautiful. Now, if you spend the time to study the book of Nehemiah, you realize that there were about 10 gates or so that, that were around the city walls. And one of the gates was called the, the Corinthian gate. People believe it's called the Corinthian gate. It's made of fine brass. Some people believe that it's of gold. Now, hear me. Remember, this was the time of Pentecost. That same season, people had come. So Jerusalem was packed with a lot of people. And because Jerusalem was packed with a lot of people, all the gates were open for people to come in because they didn't want traffic at the temple site. So all the gates were open. The dung gate, the fish gate, the off gate. Look at, look, at Nehemiah, look at Nehemiah, I believe. Nehemiah chapter number 3 or 6 as the, the gates. But there was a gate that was called the beautiful gate. The name Beautiful Gate is on the eastern side, eastern wall. And it's called a beautiful gate because of the beauty. Now, this gate is so beautiful that people will come from all it's so it's gigantic, it's massive. Over it's almost the same. Some people say it's almost uh 74, some I don't know, but it's it's, gig, it's massive. That and it's made up of gold and bronze and interwoven. So much so that people would have to travel to the temple site just to go through the gate. So this man strategically put himself by that gate. It was very common back in the day that the gate was so beautiful that people who came through the gate were wealthy people. Because you have to be of a certain class to go through that. It's like, it's like in, in America you have your uh, fast track. I believe you have your fast track. Um, well, if you're going to the airport, right, you have your fast track. And the purpose of the fast track is that you beat the, you beat the queue, you beat the traffic. So there was a gate that was open for, for rich people. <laughs> Everybody in the church business. And, and this gate that was open for the rich people, it was opened up so that they can beat the traffic. It was like a fast track to the temple. And only wealthy people came through this place because you have to pay a large sum of money. So the beggars strategically put themselves by this gate. Because... Everyone who came through these gates were showed signs of concern and were rich and could give you a lot of money. So beggars by these gates were not really poor. <laughs> they actually they actually rich beggars. Okay. So but they were by this gate. So this gate was actually a gate that was very known because it attracted tourists from different parts of the, the Ro known Roman world then back in the day, and they came to this gate. Bible said this man was there by the gate copied, but he was there to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Now, this man did not enter the temple. A lot of people believe that this gate was the gate that moved from the gentile part to the women part. But this man was not receiving the blessings of the temple. Remember this. He was outside of the gate. Whether he was a Jew or whether he was a gentile, we have no clue. But he was not allowed because he was lame from his mother's womb. He was leprous. 
or he was lame. But this man stayed by the gate. So this man never had a supernatural encounter. He only had testimonies. So people might go into the, the temple and have their, their whatever it is. They come back and he only hears what goes on. He never sees. And because of that, his eyes are always down. Because guess what is by the gate begging? The Bible says that it was he, he begged everyone who, who, who entered the temple. In verse 3, who seen Peter and John about to enter into the temple? Because Peter and John will use the word that only rich people would use. Who seen Peter and John about to enter the temple? Ask for arms. Because if you are going through these gates, you must be wealthy. But I don't know how God supernaturally put Peter and John there. And someone asked me one time, why did Jesus heal this man if Jesus was going to the temple every day? This man has been there. I said, maybe because Jesus never came through this gate. Because this gate was for the elites. Oh, you need to switch it for that. <laughs> I'm joking. But it's interesting how this man has been by that gate and Jesus went to the temple and this guy was not healed. Because I believe that Jesus never came through that gate. But for some supernatural reason, the Bible says that Peter and John came through this gate and the man was asking for arms. Bible says in verse 4, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Now, the man was trying to look at their arms. Peter says, look at us. Now, it's interesting. Peter said, look at us. Guess what he says? So, the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, this will blow your mind. Now, some translation might tell you, expect to receive arms. I like this scripture, this translation. It was expected to receive something. We know it's arms, but the writer used the word something. Because he's trying to want to use the play on words to say, well, something is coming, but not arms. And I love this thing because a lot of times we, we are asking God for something, but God gives us, an, let's keep reading. The Bible says, expected to receive something from them in verse number 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. Why? Why did he use the word silver and gold? Because silver and gold are representations of wealth. That gate was a gate for wealthy people. That gate was a gate that if you have silver and gold and you're rich, silver and gold represents wealth. And Peter said, you're looking at me to give you money because you believe that I've come through this gate, I'm wealthy. Silver and gold I do not have. Now hear me. But such, Bible says, I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. Hold on one moment. Now this is the part, why has this become a problem for me as I read the scripture? I realized that in the times of Paul, sorry, the times of Peter, in the times of the Pentecost experience, the apostles did not really have silver and gold, but they had Jesus. The early church did have wealth, but they had Christ. The modern church did not have Christ, they have wealth. Let us sink in for a while. And I'm not trying to bring it in Mammon Rio, prosperity gospel now. The early church did not have wealth, but they had Christ. I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but such as I have, I give. It's interesting how Peter and John say to the man, I know, I know you were expecting us to give you money. I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but I have Jesus. So the early church they didn't really have material possession, but they had Jesus. The modern church did not really have Jesus, they had material possession. And I think that's the reason why lame people in our churches have not been raised. Why is the church not raising lame men anymore in this day and age? When I mean lame, spiritually lame people. Lame in their mind, lame in their health, lame in their emotions, lame. The church is lame. And you will see the reason why the church is lame in a moment. The church is lame because the people who are meant to have Jesus have money. And that is the church of later here. If you look at the church of later here, the last church, the Bible speaks about how the church says they are wealthy but have nothing. They are rich but they have nothing. So we live in a day and age where right now we have so much money but not the Messiah. And Peter in his day had no silver but had a savior. I have no gold but have God. That's a play on word but that's a good word. Peter says, I have no silver but I have a, I have a savior. I have no gold but I have God. So in the old day, in the, in the early church, there was no silver and gold but there was a savior and God. In the new age, in this contemporary age, we don't have God and Savior. We have gold and silver. And, and, and Peter writes to them. And Peter says, 
uh, Peter says, but such that I have, I give you. What does he have? Now, that, there's a column there. Such as, the Bible says, in the name. Now, this is the name. It says, in the name of oh God. It's interesting how the Bible says, Paul writes to the, to, to the church in Philippi and says that there was no name under the theologians in the world. There was no name under heaven by what you say, but at the name of Jesus, at the mention of the name, Jesus, every knee shall bow. Things in the heavens, under the heavens, on the earth, under the earth. Bible says that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I don't know which Jesus you guys are talking about in your churches these days, but this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, Luke is a physician, and Luke would emphasize on the muscular strength of his ankles. And Bible says, rise up and walk. I don't have the gold and the silver that you're looking for from people. You're looking for arms, A-L-M-S, but I've got to give you the word of the Lord. Rise up and walk. And it took him by the right hand. And remember, when Peter released the word, it took the man by the right hand. Oh God, help me by the right hand and lifted him up. So this guy had faith. And, and, and I think for me, I think for me, this guy, this guy did not faith. This guy did not even need faith. Peter released the word. He's never heard anyone speak about Jesus before. He's never heard anyone talk about rise up and walk before. When Peter was saying in the name of Jesus, he's like, you must be crazy. What are you talking about? This guy doesn't understand what you're talking about. He's been by the temple wall every single day. And you're saying in the name of Jesus, who is this Jew? What are you talking about? Because the reason, okay, the reason why Peter had to stretch his hand to raise him up was because this man did not believe or did not have a clue who Jesus was. In his mind, what are you talking about? So Jesus helped, helped him, helped him, helped him understand that you may not know the Jesus, but I know your Jesus. So Peter was the one who pulled him up. Why? Because this man cannot rise up from a name he doesn't believe. Yeah, me church. You cannot rise up from a name that he doesn't believe. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, hear me. One of the effective ways to reach out to people is not just to confess Jesus with your mouth, but to raise them with your hands. I believe that an effective church is not, a, it's not just a confessional church, it's also a professional church. Peter was able to let us understand that it is one thing to confess Jesus' name. It's another thing to raise men up. I believe that an effective church in this day and in the time to come is not just a church that will call out the name of Jesus, but a church that will raise up men also. Because I believe that most of our churches are not even community-based or communal-based because we like to call the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, but don't know how to raise men up from their, from their limb spaces. And, and that's the reason why Peter said, I've given you the name, but I, I need to raise you up. I think, this is mere conjecture. I believe that a healthy church is the one that professes and confesses Jesus and also lifts men up. So a church is a lifter of men as to confess to Jesus. I'm teaching our church the work of act. I'm teaching our church that charity is an element of the church. I'm teaching our church that when we confess Jesus, let's raise men up also. It's one thing to confess Jesus and lead men in their broken places. Your mouth and your hand must work together. As you confess with your mouth, you lift men with your hand. Why do we have men and women in the church again and again, still broken, still messed up, still wounded? It's because we like to confess without actively raising them. I believe that in the days that we're about to enter Brook Place and other churches, hear me out, that we will not just confess Jesus on the pulpit, but we'll raise men. And raising men is actively going down and pulling them up. Because we are tired of hearing people preach over us. The people are tired. They are broken. They are lame. They are leprous by that beautiful gate. And you can come preach a beautiful sermon. And nothing will move them. Peter had just made a name. He's just baptized, he baptized 3,000 people. A lot of you don't even have time for these people. But Peter said, you know what? I've confessed with my mouth and I have to lift it with my hand. And I believe that in the days that we are, we need more hand lifters, not just not just word smith, not just men that know how to how to exegete the scripture. If we exegete with our mouth, let's exercise with our hands, and that's what we fail because we are good exegetes with our mouth, but we are not even we don't have grace to raise men from their broken places. So the Bible says that when Peter said, "Silver or gold I don't have, but such as I have, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk," Peter did not end there. Bible says he held the man by the hand and lifted him up. It was Peter who lifted the man up. 
my mouth, sorry, my hand must be as effective as my mouth. If I exercise my mind and I teach solid theology, my hand must do the work also. Because I will not preach on people and my hand is far away from me. The Lord said to the script in the scriptures, my hands are not, my hands are not far away from you. See what we have in the church today. Our mouth are before people, our hands are far from them. That's what we are in the church today. Let me make this big let me make this big so you can see my face properly. Let me show you where the church is today. See how the church is today. Our mouth close to the camera and our hands behind. So we are so we are so we are so close to your for your ears and we're, we're preaching, but our hands are far away. And, and, and now we, we're raising amputees, homilists, amputees, amputees, exegetes. We're raising preachers, we've amputated our hands, but we fasten our mouth. Peter said, my hand must be as good as my mouth. Let's keep reading, okay? I don't want to spend all the time here today. All right. The Bible says, lift him up. And immediately his feet and his ankle bones receive strength. His feet and his ankle bones. I believe that there will be strength that will come back to people in the church because people are tired. And the only way that we can speak, bring the gospel is to witness to them and lift them up. Okay? Bible says, and Bible says receive strength. That word strength means that it, it, it's like the, the bones clasp together. Now, Luke is a physician and he used a medical term there. I mean, Luke's use of words it is so precise that even physicians in his day asked if they, want, they, they needed an, an encyclopedia that he used for these terms. The Bible says that the, the, the man's bones we are, we are strengthened. In verse 8, so he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple. So if he entered the temple, it meant that he was a Jew. With them, walking, leaping and praising God in the temple. So this man left the gate. This therefore tells us that he would have loved the worship. But he couldn't enter the church or the temple because he was leprous. But once healing came, another soul was one. The Bible says, praising God in verse number 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms. Because this guy was famous. He was a famous beggar. At the beautiful gate. So people who saw him at the beautiful gate knew. That's the guy by the gate. That's the guy at the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to the man. They were filled with wonder. Like, what happened to this man? My, my God! So you, you realize that it was the name of Jesus and the hand of the apostles that wrought miracles. Remember the Bible says, the hand of the apostles wrought miracles. You see that in a moment. Then the Bible says, they asked themselves, what happened to this man? Now the layman who was healed on, it was held on to, who held on to Peter and John. This man was healed and held on to Peter and John. You know, and all the people ran together to them. Now, now this is interesting because people are going to the temple and now people are distracted because it's no longer the temple. The, 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 the scribe, we are waiting, the Pharisees, we are waiting to start reading from the scrolls. And now Peter and John are stolen the attention. And this will tell the reason why in chapter number 4, arrest was ordered. I'll, I'll, let's read the scripture. The Bible says, All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon. So Solomon's porch or Solomon's portico. The Bible says, greatly amazed. This guys, we are by the porch of Solomon. Greatly amazed in verse 12. So Peter saw it. So Peter saw the crowd is coming to him. No longer in the temple, but they're coming to him. The Bible says, or where he was at the time, that when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel. Now hear me. This is second, his second sermon. If his first sermon, men of Jerusalem and Judea. His second sermon, men of Israel. Why? You realize that when it says Jerusalem and Judea, what comes to mind is that a lot of times there's a distinction between Judah, Judea, Judah, and Israel. Because a lot of times Judah may be seen as the southern kingdom. And Israel is known as the northern kingdom. If you look at the scripture, when Jeroboam and Rehoboam split, the northern kingdom were taken by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom were taken by the Babylonians. The northern kingdom is also what you call the house of Israel. And the southern kingdom is called the house of Judah. So in chapter number 2, it's almost like when Peter was addressing the Jerusalem and Judea, it was addressing the southernness, the southern parts, and that's addressing the every part with the northern parts. 
Are you hearing? Every part with the northern part. So he expanded the focus. It's not just about Jerusalem anymore. It's now Israel. The Bible says, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why you look so intently at us? Remember the first time the Bible said in chapter number 2, the people marveled. And it says, Men of Judah and Jerusalem, this was what was spoken of the prophet Joel. Now he says, Why do you look so intently at us? As though by our own power or our own goodness, we have done made this man walk. It is not by our strength that this man walk. Miracles is not done by our strength. The Bible says, The God of Abraham, and this guy, Peter, went as far back as the God of Abraham. Remember, in the scripture you read in chapter number two, he only went as far back as David and Joel, when he dealt with the Israel, so dealt with Judah and Jerusalem. Now, to deal with Israel, he went to Abraham. Follow me, understand the structure of the Bible. When he was dealing in chapter number two with Judah and Jerusalem, he went as far back as David. David. But now he's dealing with Israel, he's going as far back as Abraham, a wider spectrum, a wider place. He said, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, who Joel spoke about in the last day. David spoke about Jesus, who is called, who he called his own Lord. But the, the farthest that Peter went in chapter 2 was David because he was dealing with that Davidic dynasty, that servant part. Because it was the Davidic dynasty that had Judah and Benjamin. While the remaining 10 tribes are taken by the Assyrians. But now guess what he's doing right now? It's not bringing a fuller, wider picture. Are you following me, church? So he went as far back as their forefathers, Abraham, and referred to Christ. That the God of our fathers glorified his son, his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. He was speaking to the Jews that the Jews denied Jesus in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So realize from this scripture that Pilate, like you read before, Pilate was determined to let Jesus go. It was the Jews who stuck and held on Jesus. Crucify him. Crucify him. So Peter, even though in that whole conversation, denied Jesus three times, also knew that his own brethren were the ones who held Pilate. The Roman system wanted to release Jesus, but the Jewish brethren said no, crucify him. So Peter was reminding his own people that the miracle that you just witnessed was done by your Jesus that you crucified. When is that to let him go? But you deny the Holy One and the just, the Holy One and the just. It's called Holy One, it's called the just one as well. And asked for a murderer to be granted to you. They brought Jesus and a Barabbas, Barabbas, they brought a criminal with Jesus and, 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 they, and, they, and they say, who would you choose? Pilate asked. And they chose him. But what you don't understand that that was the law of imputation. That he who knew no sin became sin and took the place of a sinful man. So when they brought a condemned criminal and they brought Jesus, he was a condemned criminal. Jesus was the holy and just one. That's what the Bible says now. But instead of the just one to be free, the just one was condemned. But that was the law of imputation. That's what Paul says in Romans, that he who knew no sin, he who was holy, became condemned, and he who was condemned took the place of the Holy One. It's called imputation. That is a marketplace terminology. Marketplace was not about money. The context of marketplace was exchange. The great exchange was Jesus taking the place of a criminal. It's called imputation. The Bible says, to be granted to you in verse 15. And kill the prince of life. Jesus is the prince. See the name? The first name is called you know, the son of David. And the holy one is the just one. He's the, he's the prince of life. Whom God raised from the dead. Of which you we are witnesses. So Peter was saying that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now Peter is preaching to them. The message of the kingdom. Of the gospel. And his name. Through faith in his name. Has made this man strong. His name. Through faith in his name. The man did not have faith in the name of Jesus. It was Peter and John that had name in the faith of Jesus. For healing to occur. The, 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 uh, the practitioners or the steward of the healing must be men of faith. A lot of times we expect the recipient to be the men of faith. It is the, it's not the respondent that needs faith. Literally, it is the one who is the professor that needs faith. It is by the name of Jesus, the Bible says, has made this man strong whom you see and know. 
So this man was there, but it is the name of Jesus. Somebody said the name. The name, I, I feel like the name of Jesus. And let me just prophesy for just, I'm a prophet, I apologize. I know I'm going to teach you. I need to prophesy. I cannot go without prophesying. And I feel like a lot of you are like this man by this beautiful gate. You are just a step into your beautiful space, a step into a beautiful marriage, a step into a beautiful job, a step into a beautiful relationship, a step into a beautiful career, a step into a beautiful hell. I believe that some of you are like this man. You've been by the gate called beautiful a long time and everyone has looked at you and they've given you stipends and said, well, maybe someday something will happen. Maybe someday a miracle will happen. Maybe someday something great will shift in your life. But the Bible says that when Peter and John saw the man, they said, I've got no silver. I've got no good, but in the name of Jesus, I've come to even release the word of the Lord to you today. I know you've come to learn word by word, commentary and exposition, but I believe as God's prophet, that as you've tuned in this life today, that everything called beautiful in your life that's about to happen, will happen even now, at the end of this teaching, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who once died and rose again, the Bible says, and Peter said to them, this same Jesus is a just one, is a holy one, he's the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead of which we are, I am a witness and his name through faith has made you strong I decree and I prophesy in the name of Jesus that everything weak in your life, financial weakness, marital weakness relational weakness, your health weak, I prophesy in the name of Jesus, you're about to receive strength say yes Lord Woo! I didn't want to do this, but I have to prophesy. Say yes, Lord. You will not just come here and just hear acts as theatrics or a theory. You will experience a miracle, I believe, in the name of Jesus. Every witness in your bodily organs. I curse everything from the roots right now to receive strength. In the name of Jesus, you will realize that, that it's not just a theoretical study, but it's of demonstration and of power. I prophesy in the name of Jesus. Power is coming upon your bones. Power is coming upon your health. Power is coming upon your marriage. Power is coming upon your relationship. Power is coming upon your children. My God, power is coming upon the brook place. Power is coming upon your assembly. Power, my God, my God. Power is coming. Apologize for those of you that are. You want the Bible? I apologize to you. I, I just cannot help it. I, I'm, I'm a prophet, so I cannot, I, cannot, I cannot see a bubbling and ignore. There is power. The book of Acts is not just a book to read. It's a book to encounter. But the Bible says, you know, and his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And, 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 and yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And, and I pray that there is perfect soundness in the Gada. Fellow children in the Los Kapaya. Perfect soundness. Somebody say, I've got a perfect sound mind. Bible says, a perfect soundness. Ah. Oh. It's a perfect implication. So the Bible says, Peter was right. And Peter says, this one has perfect soundness. And this is a public testimony in the witness of you all. Bible says in verse 17, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in England. So Peter was still preaching about Jesus. And Jesus that you killed is the reason why this man is healed. And he's got perfect soundness. Oh, it's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of, of sound mind. A power of love and of a sound mind. Bible says, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers, which are your, your elders, your, 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 your rulers of the, of the temple. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he has thus, so Christ has fulfilled the sufferings from the prophets, from the writings. Repent, therefore, the second time. The first time he said them to repent and be baptized. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Ooh, convert is a good word there. Converted. Change of mind. That your sins may be blotted out. He was speaking to the multitudes there at the temple gathering. So that times of refreshing may come from the prayer. So that, that time, that times of refreshing will come, may come from the presence of the Lord. A refreshing time. Bible says, and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. 
under the times of restoration. That, that, that word, times of restoration, I don't want to go into the technicalities of that. It means the Jubilee year. The Jubilee year was, is 50 years. Uh, every 50th year, that's what you call the Jubilee year, where uh, the, 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 the slaves are free, the lands are, 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 are taken back. You know, But in Israel, back in the day, you don't really buy a land, you lease the land. Every 50 years, the land goes back to the original owner. Uh, your debts are cancelled. Uh, so it's called the Jubilee year. It's called the year, the year of... Um, restoration of all things so it means that the jubilee year is the year of restoration so the bible says whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration when of all things jubilee year you know when everything will be given back but, but, but the bible says which god has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophet since the word began all right there'll be restoration the bible says for moses truly said to the fathers the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me in your in your from your brethren. Moses professed this word. You know, um, I'm gonna give you the scripture here. We are still in, we're in verses number oh, twenty two. All right, yes. Yeah, for for Moses, for Mo, Moses truly say that the Lord will give. Finally, Deuteronomy eighteen verse fifteen that the Lord. Let's read it. That the Lord. Will, will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who would not hear the prophet shall utterly be destroyed among the people. So what's happened is that Peter was referencing the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse 15, from 15, what you know Moses had said. Are you following church? What Moses had said. So in verses number 24, I believe, the Bible says, Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel, from Samuel, and those who follow. So all the prophets from Samuel, because Samuel was the first national recognized civil leader on the prophet. And those who follow, the Bible says, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. So the prophets prophesied that Jesus was the Messiah, and they were meant to listen to Jesus. But the Bible says in 25, you are sons of the prophets. When is soon, we end, we end that in five minutes. You are sons of the prophets. The Jews are the sons of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, the Abrahamic covenant, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, hear me, the covenant God made to Abraham extends beyond the Jude Jewish nation. In your seed, the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in Abraham's seed, you also have the, 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 uh, the Gentile nation being blessed. In verse 25, you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, saying to Abraham, in Abraham's seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this seed itself is not Jesus. This seed is Isaac. And that's why you have it as a small s here. In your seed, Isaac, all the families of Christ is from the seed of Isaac. All the families of the earth, not just the Jews. So Jesus is from the seed of Isaac, who is from the seed of Abraham. All the families of the earth will be blessed. So you realize there was an extension of the blessings of the Lord through the originator of Abrahamic covenant from where we have the Gentiles and the Jews. To you first, so the Bible says, to you first, God, you know I me, mean? you Jews, to you first, the Bible says that Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. You didn't hear what I'm trying to say. Even at resurrection, sent him to bless you, turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So you realize that the Jews have a way of rejecting Jesus. So when Jesus was alive, the Bible says he came to his own, his own received him not. But as many that received him to gain, gave him power to become. It's interesting that the Bible says in 26, to you first, to the Jews, we are the first to receive this good news. But these receptors or these guests refuse to accept Jesus. And the Bible says, but as many as those that received him, to them gave he the power. To become the word sons of God in the scriptures is a direct creation. You and I we were not we are not sons of God by creation. Sons of God, Ben Ha Elohim. Let me write that down. It means direct creation. Sons of God, 
are Adam. The angels are sons of God, the red creation. You and I are sons of God by regeneration, not by creation. Okay, let me put this down because of time. I've got a few minutes to go. I'm ending now. So you and I are not necessarily sons of God. Like, one moment, guys. Okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, we go. I think I was going to write on the but I think my system is disconnected. All right. The sons of God, I'm going to have my, my, my stuff is disconnected. It's called Ben Ha Elohim, which is called the sons of God. So we are not sons of God by generation or creation. We are sons of God by recreation. Does that make sense? We are sons of God by recreation. That's what we are. Mm moment here so we are sons of god by recreation but the bible says to you first god having raised up his servant sent him to bless you in turning you turning away every one of you from your iniquities so peter stood there and preached an entire message at the temple the second time it's interesting as you look at chapter number two and chapter number three you find peter's first and second sermon now because peter had released these words at the temple this will lead to an arrest in chapter number four and then peter would address the sanhedrin's which would be a third sermon now remember every time peter addressed the people it was a different class of people in chapter two it was those in jerusalem and in judea in chapter three it was israel in chapter 4, it will be the Sanhedrins. The Sanhedrins are the, um, the the council of Pharisees and Sadducees who judge civil matters. And then Peter will also give a sermon there. Wherever Peter had a chance to speak, he always spoke. All right. So that is the end and the close of chapter number 3. So we started at 8 o'clock. We ended at... Um, 11 o'clock, UK time. But let me hear from you. Has this really blessed you? Is this something, would you like to commit to this teaching again and again? Our next teaching will be on Sunday. I don't know if I'm going to do two classes, two, two chapters on Sunday. I might do one and then do two again. It looks like, look like Tuesdays is much more better for two classes. But let me hear from you, ladies and gentlemen. Has this blessed you? Would you tell your friends and families to join us on Sunday? As we continue chapter number four. Now remember, you're not just reading this book. You are following a story of how the Lord breathed, breathed upon them. And now they had Matthias. And how they were empowered by the Spirit. And now the day of Pentecost had come. And I've spent the time I broke Pentecost to you. Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. How we are in the middle right now. And then we have three more to go. And then we reach up chapter number you know, two. Had, the, the Lord added to the numbers of the people in the church. And chapter number three. This has blessed you. Join us again on Sunday for chapter number four of the book of Acts. If you can read it, read it and join us on Sunday. But we're going to go again verse by verse commentary of the entire work. I believe that this is God's idea for us as a church to grow and understand what he meant in scripture. You know, that Paul worked by demonstration. Now, how we want to raise a church that is not just there to host conferences, but to be the uh, uh, steward, the oikonomos. Of God's, of God's revelation. Every one of you at the Brook Place, whether you're online, whether you're in person, I want you to go back again and watch chapter 2 and 3. It's three hours. But watch it. I mean, you've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You've got four days to digest this word. I try to make it as basic as I can make it, but you have to go back again and drink and drink and drink. Share with your friends. Share with your family. And then there were some things there that shook your theologies. It's basic, I promise you. Maybe the next book we're going to read in Mummy Romans, maybe Corinthians. It's probably going to be a bit theological. But until then, have an amazing day. Remember, the Brook Place every Sunday, 4.30 p.m. If you don't have a local church, you're looking for a church to join that will feed you this level of meat and even more because this is introduction. Join us on Sunday. You might have a local church and your church may not give deep insight to biblical study like this. 
and we want to say join us on sunday and grow this is for the kingdom come grow with us you know we're going to give you language to these encounters and pray for you also so if you don't have a local church you're not part of a local church you don't have a house that you're part of but you want to grow or you know someone that don't have a house but want to grow especially if they are in the uk london precisely share the video with them and tell them it's going to be two months of extensive intensive exegetical hermeneutical practical theoretic theoretical um growth in your work with god tell them to join us every sunday at 4 30 pm www.thebrookplace.org mm. it was really tasty right mm -hmm. the brookplace.org search us out i have videos and we have a lot of stuff online join us on sunday 4 30 pm we cannot wait to have you especially now that we want to start the uh uh, the group study, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to organize the group study and put out something to get you guys involved. We want to do a group study, especially for church, those in church and those online. We want to be part of this group study as we read, learn, grow together. The Lord bless you. We educate the church. We empower the chosen and we equip the called. And we pray that this has blessed you and we'll see you on Sunday. Have an amazing day and peace. Bye for now.